Hello everyone and welcome to the Python 3 in 100 minutes course. First, I would like to thank you all for enrolling in this course. That means a lot to me and I hope you will find the course useful and informative. All right, so in this lecture, first we're going to cover um, a course overview. So we're going to provide the course best practices then we're going to cover how can we download the course materials. And then we're going to learn how can we get help and ask questions. And in general, how to succeed in this course. And also, because I get that question a lot, how to get the certificate of completion at the end of this course. All right. So let's get started. So first, regarding the best practices, so first, Udemy gives you the option to change the video speeds. I know that, you know, most of you guys um, are familiar with Udemy and, you know, probably know this uh, information. But for students who are generally new to Udemy, I just wanted to give you an overview of what tools do you have at your disposal if you wanted to change, for example, the video speed. So in general, you have the option to play the lectures at different speeds. So you can select 0.5x, which means you are slowing the speed, 0.7x or 1x, which is basically the speed that I filmed the videos at. And then you can also, you know, maybe if you are familiar with the content, you can just speed it up. So you can go to, let's say, 1.25, 1.5 until 2x if you wanted to. And in order to do that, you will find that in the bottom left corner here in the videos, you will find that there is uh, basically like, you know, that one X sign, then you can click on it and then you can pick whatever speed that you, um, you would find uh, helpful for you or suitable for you. The next best practice is how can we change the video playback quality? I get that question again a lot and Udemy mainly uh, automatically optimizes the video resolution based on your internet connection speed, which means if you have slower speed, Udemy will adjust the speed to basically make you um, stream with no um, pause in between. And that's why you might find, for example, the resolution is dropped to let's say 360p or 480p. This course, in this course, all course lectures have been filmed with an HD quality of 1080p. All right, so if you find, for example, that you know maybe the resolution is not clear and so on, please go ahead and uh, try to change. Just don't go to auto, just go and force it to go to 720p or 1080p if you wanted to. All right, the next best practice is, okay, how can I reach out for help? You know, if I have any Udemy platform issues, please go ahead and send an email to support at udemy.com. Again, I don't have any control over platform issues. I just mainly um, produce the content. So if you encounter any platform issues, just please reach out to them and they will be so happy to help you out. The next question is, how can we download the course material? So in the introduction section, you will find a zip file, okay, that contains all notebooks and slides. So mainly you will find that there is Python in 100 minutes package .zip. Please go ahead, download this and unzip it. Mainly, and, and what, that's what I highly recommend, that you download it on your desktop. Okay, so you basically you just click on it, download it on your desktop, and then unzip it because it's a zipped file. You will just gonna unzip it um, on your desktop as well because that we're gonna show you how can we open these files and how can we deal with it as well. We have another option is I might provide a link as well uh, in Udemy that will help you to download the materials um, using that specific link or you can simply just download the um, package here as you can find it as, as attached in the introduction and welcome message lecture. All right, the next question is, okay, how can I get help? How can I ask questions? So this is kind of an overview, kind of a four steps if you wanted to as for help. First, I highly recommend that you check the lecture videos for answers. In general, you will find that most of the answers are contained within the um, videos, within the lectures. Step two, you will search the previous Q&A. So if you go to the Q&A section, 
you will find there is a ton of, inf of information in there. And you can simply just search for, you know, let's say the error message you have, and highly likely you will find that, you know, the answer in there. Step three, you will search the Stack Overflow for error messages. So basically Stack Overflow is mainly kind of a website that you um, can uh, post any of your issues that you're encountering. And there is kind of, you know, you get a kind of a compiled feedback from all over the world. So it's really, really powerful. So if you have any issues, just go ahead and search Stack Overflow. Like 99%, you will find the answer. And if all of these don't work out, no problem. Please go ahead and post your, post your question in the Q&A section and our team will be happy to help you out. All right. And please, just a note, if you encounter any issues, please include a screenshot of the error as long as the lecture number so we can easily identify it and we can easily answer your question. All right. So the next question is, okay, how can I succeed in this course? How can I, you know, like, um, like make it and how can I uh, excel in it? So mainly in this course, you will find that there is a lot of exercises. So my recommendation is to please go ahead and when you have any code or any Jupyter notebook, please go ahead and run the script first. All the notes, all the notebooks are included. So please make sure that everything is running well first on your computer. And then my recommendation is you actually start a blank Jupyter notebook, just a blank page and code along with me while watching the videos. I find that to be the most effective, okay? And instead of just being, you know, like uh, acting in a passive format and just watching the videos, I find the best way to do it is to actually go ahead and write the code and code with me along while watching the videos. And in the course as well, you will find that there are many challenges. So I ask you to maybe pause the video and attempt to solve the challenge on your own. Please go ahead and when I ask you to do, just to do that, just pause the video and try to solve the problem and afterwards try to compare your answer with the solution notebook while watching the solution video lecture. I find that as well you know to be like very very um, useful to actually try to solve the problems on your own. All right so the last question is okay how can I get a certificate of completion? So basically when you complete the course you will receive a certificate of completion which is really nice because now you can share it with your coworkers and your potential employers that you have a background experience um, and knowledge with Python in general. So after you finish all the curric curriculum items, you will find that there is a red or white trophy that will appear on the course dashboard indicating that the certificate of completion is ready. So basically, you just go ahead and you will find that you can print that certificate with your name on it and that will basically um, certify you as you have completed the um, course. And if you have any information, if you need any more additional uh, information, please go ahead to this link and you'll be able to find a ton of information on Udemy website. All right. And that's all what I have for this lecture. Again, I would like to thank you for enrolling in this course and let's get started with the first lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to walk you through the course outline. So let's get started. So first, the first question, you know, again, that I get uh, a lot is why Python? Like why select, uh, why do we need to select Python as the primary programming language? First of all, Python is very easy to learn. Actually, Python is the easiest programming language to learn. And when we go through this course, you will find that by the end of this course, you will become familiar with all the concepts of how can you define variables? How can you, you know, like write or um, a code to develop, let's say a game. And it's very, very easy to learn and it's very, very useful. All right. The next uh, reason that you need to learn Python is high salary. Average salary for Python programmers in the US is around $116,000 a year, which is really great given how easy it is to acquire mainly this skill. The third reason, which is versatility, which means um, you can actually use Python in, in, in so many different applications, so many different fields. So Python can be used for web development, for data science, for machine learning, for computer vision, scripting, gaming, 
and you can even use it for robotics application too. The fourth reason that you need to learn Python or why are we even teaching Python in this course is the job availability and mainly um, it's kind of you're, you're investing in your future in a way. First, high demand and low supply for Python developers make it an ideal programming language to learn right now. So, so basically, there's a, there are a lot of jobs at the moment as we speak um, in Python programming and there is mainly low supply of Python developers. So that's a great opportunity. And the next reason, which is very, very important reason, is that Python is the number one programming language for machine learning and AI or artificial intelligence which basically like that's the direction in which everyone is going to at the moment which is you know you'll hear this these buzzwords everywhere ai artificial intelligence machine learning and so on so python is the number one programming language actually used for in these fields that's why knowing python is essential and i actually teach a lot of other courses on udemy mainly related to machine learning and ai please go ahead and check them out Again, this course will help you a lot in just laying the foundations of uh, Python programming. All right. The next uh, topic, which is I wanted to discuss in this lecture, is the course outline. Okay, what are we going to learn in this um, um, course? First, we're going to walk you through the introduction and welcome message. Then we're going to have mainly a section on an installation and setup. So we're going to see uh, how can we install an anaconda, okay, which is mainly a development environment that we're going to use to write our codes, okay? Again, please, here I'm assuming that you are not, like you haven't done any programming in the past, which is totally fine. We are gonna start from the basic, a basics, absolute basics, and we're gonna have a detailed video lectures to show you how can we install mainly Anaconda, which we're gonna be using here uh, in this course, and we're gonna learn how can we run what we call it a Jupyter Notebook. Simply put, Jupyter Notebook, think of it as, you know, like a Microsoft Word, just a blank piece of paper that you're going to write your code in. That's all what it is, okay? So that we're going we're gonna to learn how to do these in the installation and setup section. And then we're going to have a variables and data types section. So we're going to cover how can we define numbers? How can we perform a mathematical operation? Let's say, how can we add numbers? multiply numbers, divide numbers by each other. How can we uh, define or initiate what we call a string, which think of it as kind of a series of characters, just letters. Again, we're gonna discuss all that in, in great details. We're gonna learn how can we print on the screen? How can we show something on the screen? How can we define a list? Again, here, this should be a list, my apologies. And then we're gonna learn how can we do dictionaries, tuples, and booleans. Again, we're going to discuss that in great details in the course. And that should conclude the variables and data type section. And then we're going to cover comparisons and logical operator section, which is how can we define what we call it if statement or conditional statement. Think of it as, you know, like I'm saying, okay, if, for example, my mark in the exam is above, let's say, 60 out of 100, then that means I pass the exam. If it's below 60, then the student, for example, fail the exam, something like this. And that's what we call it if statement. Again, we're gonna discuss that in great details in this section. And then the next section, we're going to discuss what we call it loops, for loops and while loops, which mainly use to repeat a certain section within your code. So sometimes I need, for example, to let's say add, not add, let's say five numbers together, together, for example. So instead of writing, you know, like the first number plus the second number and so on, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna repeat, kind of write one, one line of code and then run a loop on it just to repeat that process several times. And now to the fun part. At the end, mainly after we cover all these basics, we're gonna have the project section and we're gonna learn how can we build three practical fun projects from scratch, which is gonna be very, very interesting, very exciting. Again, please note that this course is for beginners and it's mainly used, you know, kind of as a guideline, as kind of introduction to Python. 
So at the end of this, obviously, like, you know, Python includes, uh, to learn Python, there's a lot of other, you know, like, um, like um, topics we need to discuss. Like, for example, like, we have to define functions, how to do, let's say, uh, like more advanced operations, like object-oriented programming. But here, we're in this course, we are not going to cover any of these topics. Mainly, we're going to cover, again, the introduction, installation, how to perform variables and their data types, comparison and the logical operators, loops, and then we're going to build three fun practical projects from scratch together. All right. So the question is, okay, who is this course for? Who should take this course? This course is geared to mainly anyone who wants to learn the fundamentals of Python programming. It's mainly meant for absolute beginners who have maybe like zero programming experience in the past. There is no prior experience at all. So even if you have never used Python or any programming language before, don't worry. And we are going to have a clear video explanation for each of the topics we are going to cover. Again, we are going to start from the basics and gradually build up your knowledge. So please stay tuned and um, let's get started. In the next lecture, I'm going to walk you through the installation and setup and how can we actually install Anaconda and Jupyter Notebooks. And then we're going to start, start off with the first topic. Please stay tuned and see you guys in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to walk you through how can we download Anaconda, mainly for Windows, for Mac OS, and for Linux as well. And I'm going to walk you through kind of the uh, installation steps. It's very, very straightforward and very easy. So the question is, what is Anaconda? Like, what is it? All right. So if you go to Anaconda website, you will find that simply Anaconda distribution is one of, is one of the most popular Python data science platforms. Simply put, it's just, it's a really, really powerful kind of, you know, like a package that contains all the, contains Python, obviously, and contains pretty much all the machine learning and AI kind of packages contained in there. You just download it once, and then it, it within the package as well, it will include the Jupyter Notebooks, which is kind of the development environment that we will use to develop all our codes. All right, so again, I highly recommend use uh, Anaconda. There is over 6 million users, you know, as we speak right now. It's an open source distribution, and it's one of the fastest and easiest way to do Python and R data science and machine learning. Again, it's very, very famous in the industry, and everyone pretty much is using it. Again, Anaconda Enterprise is an AI machine learning enabler platform that empowers organizations to develop, govern, and automate AI and machine learning models as well. Obviously, we're not going to be using Enterprise. We're just going to use the Anaconda distribution, the basic ones. All right. So simply, if you go to, again, anaconda.com, if you go here to the downloads, it will show you that you have different options. You have option for Windows. You have option for Mac OS. And you have an option to download for Linux as well. Let's say if you're going to pick Windows, for example, just click on it. And then it will show you that we have two options. We have either Python 3.7 version or Python 2.7 version. Please, please choose 3.7 version. We are not going to use 2.7, all right? We are only going to use 3.7 version. Again, press on download button and then you will find the notes specific. There is a specific location. You just click save and here we go. Simply, it's around 600 megabytes. So please make sure that you actually have the size available for you. Uh, actually, I have it already installed, so just going to pause it here. And what's going to happen afterwards, if you go to scroll down, and if you go to the Anaconda documentation, if you open it, it will show you the different installation guides for simply different um, um, platforms. So you'll find that we have an installation on Windows, an installation on Mac OS, an installation on Linux. It's very, very straightforward and very clear. If you go to installation on Windows, you will find that this is simply after you download the Anaconda installer, you will find that there is just a graphical way of just setting it up. So we're just going to find the screen. You press next, you come here, and then you press install and so on. You keep moving forward and then you press finish and that's it. Here we go. Now you have Anaconda installed on Windows. If you want to do the same for Mac OS, if you go here installing on Mac OS, press on it. 
and then it will show you the different again setup on how to perform the installation on macOS. It's very very clear, very very straightforward. If you go to installation on Linux, here we go. These are kind of the installation on Linux. All right. After you download Anaconda, then you are good to go. In the next lecture, I'm going to show you how can we launch a specific what we call a Jupyter notebook, which is again the development environment. We're going to develop all our Python codes within it. Again, please go ahead, perform the Anaconda uh, installation. If you run through any issues, please uh, post post them on the Q, in the Q and A section, and I'll be happy to help you out. All right, and that's pretty much all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and see you guys in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to give you an overview of how to use Jupyter Notebooks. Um, Jupyter Notebooks is very, very powerful kind of tool and an open source web application that can help us write codes and um, share documents as well. And we're actually going to be using it pretty much throughout the course. So I'm going to walk you through it, how to run a Jupyter Notebook how to um, run a specific code, and how to um, create code from scratch. All right, so first, what is Jupyter Notebook? So a Jupyter Notebook is simply an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live codes. So what's really powerful about Jupyter Notebooks is that you can actually write code. So like here, for example, let's say if we try to zoom in a little bit, so if you guys take a look at it here, you'll find that you can actually write a code in here, as you guys can see here, and you can write text as well. So think of it as kind of, you know, a mix or a hybrid approach between, let's say, a Word document where you actually have text in here. You can write whatever you want. You can write equations. You can write text. You can write whatever you want. And in specific cells, you can actually write um, specific codes. And what's really powerful and just, you know, amazing about Jupyter Notebooks, I actually like, you know, huge fan of them, is that when you run this specific cell, which is, let's say, uh, like a, a code cell, what happened is you will find that the actual, let's say, image or the results are actually plotted right ahead, just right after the code, which is really powerful because now you are pretty much have everything in just one place, which is incredible. Now you have the text, you can write, you know, your own notes. You can write your own titles. You can write your own equations. And then you have your code, okay, which is, you know, like a bunch of lines of code you can write in different languages. And then afterwards, you come up with the results, which is amazing. Now you can have images. You can have, you know, like, let's say, the results of an equation, for example. So everything is just contained in one kind of stop shop, which is really powerful. All right, again, if you guys are a little bit confused, don't worry about it. I'm going to start, you know, a Jupyter Notebook from scratch. I'm going to walk you through all the steps, you know, like step by step. So again, the Jupyter Notebook is an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, visualizations, and narrative text. You can mainly, it uses mainly um, data cleaning and transformation, numerical simulations, statistical modeling, and so on, and machine learning as well. All right. So again, if you have, if you, if you downloaded um, an Aconda distribution, you should have Jupyter already installed in there. So the first question is, how can we install Jupyter Notebook? All right, so you, if you have an Aconda distribution has already uh, installed on your computer, you should have Jupyter already installed. So you should have it available already. So this is just a quick overview of what do we mean by Jupyter uh, Notebooks and why we're gonna be using it for in the next lecture, I'm going to walk you through how can we start a blank Jupyter Notebook and how can we start to write codes, write equations, run a notebook, and as well write samples um, from our um, uh, course package. And until then, please enjoy machine learning and I will see you guys in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how can we run a Jupyter Notebook and I'm going to show you how can we just write kind of the most simple code ever. I'm just going to, let's say, some two numbers together. Let's, just, let's say some five plus four. That will give us nine. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, what I want you to do is to download the course package. So as you guys remember, here we have the course package. We, um, I showed you how can we download them. 
So here we have the zipped file, which is Python in 100 minutes package to unzip it. Okay, so please go ahead and right click here and go to 7-zip and then say extract to Python in 100 minutes package. All right, and you will find that here the uh, you basically um, un unzipped it. So if you open it, you will find that's our course package. So as you guys can see here, here we have our Python 100 minutes package. Here you will find that we have section one information, section three, for example, and going down section four, this is all the comparisons, and section five for the while loops and for loops. And there is this, the projects as well, which is simply our three projects that, that we're going to be covering in this course. So first of all, what's happening here? Like, what are these? Like, you know, like, a, like a, it looks like a, like, a, like a link, you know, or like a website, for example, um, link. So basically, these are what we call it Jupyter Notebooks, which is extension IPYNB. Okay. So if you attempt to, let's say, open it, okay, if you double click on it, you will find that you simply can't open it directly. It will show you that, you know, that there is, you know, like you need a specific software or you can't download it directly and you can't open it directly. That's why we need to open it using Jupyter. So we're going to see how can we open that. So let's get started. All right. So let's see how can we, how can we open these files? So if we go here to the start menu and you type Anaconda, okay. So you'll find that there is Anaconda prompt that appears here. Just click on it. And you should find this basically showing up. As you guys can see, here it shows basically the base C users. And then that's kind of my username, which is, you know, like Ryan or Dr. Ryan. And then what you could do here, you could say, okay, let's, and please um, make sure that the actual words are correct and are the same. Okay. And they are, you're going to type Jupyter space notebook. So Jupyter, J U P. Y T E R space notebook again J U P Y. Please make sure it's Y and it's not I because if you write I, it's not gonna work. T E R space and then you will find you write notebook N O T E B double O K and then you press enter. And here we go. So as you, can, as you guys can see, it basically opened here my desktop. So if you go to the desktop here, you will find basically that's our course package, which is Python in 100 minutes package. Let's open it and let's open it. And here we go. That's exactly our folders that we had here before. If you guys remember, these are our folders here. So here we have projects, projects, section one, section one, three, four and five, right? Okay, so let's see how can we open, for example, just one sample. Let's open, go to section three, for instance, and let's open the first example, which is, you know, like this one, variables, assignments. So just click on it. And here we go. So as you guys can see here, this is what we call it Jupyter Notebook. Okay, and this is very, very, very powerful, like extremely powerful. Why? Because you can use Jupyter Notebook, as you guys can see, it looks like a, like a Word, Microsoft Word document in a way. So there is text here, there is text here, there is a bunch of tables here or maybe image. And there is like, you know, like lines of codes as well, as you guys can see here, which is amazing. Because now you have the power to simply include lines of text, an actual text. I'm going to show you what do you mean by this. You can insert, for example, like an image. And you can add lines of code as well. All right. So the first question is, I'm going to show you kind of, you know, like different tools that we're going to use to build up our, um, uh, our codes. So this is again code that I provided you already. So it has been already like uh, written before. So as you guys can see here, this is what we call it a markdown cell. So as you guys can see, if you click on it, there are different options. There is code, markdown, we're not going to use a raw or the heading, so please focus on code and mark markdown. Markdown means that this is basically just pure text. If you double click on it, you can write whatever you want in here. Okay. And then to run a specific cell, you press shift and enter. So you press shift and enter to run the cell, as you guys can see here. Okay. So this is a markdown. This is again a markdown cell. 
this is a markdown cell and so on okay if you stop here you will find that this is a different okay this is a code cell okay so which means that when you run the Jupyter notebook it will actually this line will be will be executed which means if you let's say here write 5 plus 10 let's go ahead and actually try to run it again you can stop here on the cell okay let me zoom in a little bit for you guys so here you have 5 plus 10 okay if you click on it and you press shift enter you will find that that means you are asking kind of you know Jupyter to please go ahead and run the cell kind of execute the command so when you run 5 plus 10 you will find that the answer kind of you know it's like you're applying back it's like a basic calculator it's telling you well 5 plus 10 is 15 okay which makes sense all right here we have again um, if you want to run this cell 5 times 10 shift enter it will generate 50 that means you multiply them together 1 divided by 2, shift enter, becomes 0.5. That's the answer. 2 times times 2, which is 2 power 2, shift enter, becomes 4, and so on. Again, I'm not going to go into, like, you know, run all these kind of codes because in the first lecture, in the next lecture, I'm going to show you how can we build this notebook from scratch. Okay, so don't worry about it at the moment. Here, I just wanted to show you how can we run a simple Jupyter notebook. Okay. So what if I wanted to, let's say, run the entire notebook? So if you go here to the kernel and you say restart and run all. So that should restart and run all. So if you say restart and run all, you'll find that here it's ex executed all the cells. If you guys can see here, all the cells have ran, okay, and basically uh, executed the entire thing. What if I wanted to clear everything? You can say, okay, kernel, and you will say, restart and clear output that should clear all the output so as you guys can see all the outputs here you know that the bottom of the cells have been cleared and everything here have been cleared too okay so you're ready to run each cells again if you wanted to okay sounds great all right so what if i wanted for example to let's say insert a new cell to insert a new cell you come here and you press a so if you press a you find that the new cell appeared here and then you can write whatever you want you can write let's say 5 plus let's say 10 or let's say 5 plus let's say 100 to make it different and you can press shift enter and it will show you well that's 105 that makes sense what if i wanted to delete for example a cell to delete this cell you come here and you press double d so dd that should delete the cell again to insert a new cell you press A, so if you press multiple A's, just character or letter A in the keyboard, that should create cells. If you want to delete, just come here and press double D, that should remove. Double D, double D, double D, and so on, should remove the, all the cells, as you guys uh, can see here. All right, sounds great. So as you guys can see here, now we're able to simply open the Jupyter Notebook, run a specific cell, execute a cell, understand the difference between a markdown cell like this one or an actual code cell like this one all right sounds great so one last point before we conclude this lecture what if i wanted to let's say create a new jupyter notebook you simply come here okay and you can say new and then you can specify i wanted to write or create a new python 3 mainly notebook you press Python 3 and here we go so now you basically create a new Jupyter notebook now I can call it let's say um, Python Python in 100 minutes let's say first notebook you can call it whatever you want and then you say rename and you'll find that the title here has been changed and you can find here that you can you are basically um, like ready to write whatever code you want I can say okay five times let's say 20 shift enter that will generate 100 what if I wanted for example to print something on the screen again don't worry about it I'm gonna show you how can we do that in great details but I'm gonna say print and then open parentheses and then I'm gonna write let's say hello world okay so press shift enter and you'll find that it replied back and tell you, okay, that's hello world. What I printed here in between has been shown here as kind of, you know, the feedback. 
and then you can write whatever you want you can again let's say 3 divided by let's say 2 shift enter that will generate 1.5 think of it as kind of you know like a calculator in a way in a very very simple form or fashion okay what if I wanted to let's say insert um, a new cell again as I mentioned you press A that should insert a new cell and you can specify this cell as a code or markdown so let's say if I wanted to add a title I'm gonna say okay my first code but again this is listed as code I don't want it to be a code I want it to be a markdown so I'm gonna select as markdown and shift enter and you'll find that this becomes a text which means this will not won't be executed which means if I come to kernel and say it is start and run all you will find that basically we executed all the cells uh, this one basically becomes a markdown which is not a code okay all right and that's pretty much all what i have for this lecture i hope you guys enjoyed it again please um, if you have any questions please go ahead and post it in the q a again just let's recap what we have done so far in this lecture we have been able to learn how can we uh, run a jupyter notebook and i showed you how can we perform this how can we run the entire Jupyter Notebook from scratch? How to create a new Jupyter Notebook? And how to come here and write basically a couple of lines of code or you specify a cell as a markdown as well. All right, I hope you guys enjoy this lecture and see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to cover three important topics, mainly what we call it variable assignment and then we're going to cover what we call it precedence or the order of operations and then we're going to cover how to do we perform basic mathematical operations such as addition subtraction multiplication and so on all right just quick overview before starting you know with the first uh, jupyter notebook here when you guys go uh, and open the um, course package you will mainly see kind of you know like a like a standard um, um, folder where you're gonna see that we're gonna introduce any concept, like for example, here we're introducing the strings concept. So you will find this is a lecture that we call it 3A concept that has strings, followed by the exercise right away. So you guys, again, in this course, you will find tons of exercises, all right? So you can make an attempt to actually solve the exercises on your own, and that's where you will find it has a B um, index here. And then afterwards, you guys are gonna find the solutions right away, all right? So again, in general, for each topic we're going to be introducing, you will find that there is a concept lecture, just introducing what, what it is first, all right? We're going to have some examples here as well, followed by the exercises questions, and then we're going to find the exercise solutions afterwards, all right? Okay, so let's get started. Let's first cover the first topic that we have here, which is what we call variable assignments, precedents, and basic mathematical operations. And then afterwards, we're going to cover the topic two, which is how we do print operation and how to get user input. And then we're going to cover topic three, which is strings, followed by topic four, which is lists, followed by topic five, which is dictionaries and booleans. And then we're, we're going to cover topic six, which is tuples and sets. All right, I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, this like, you know, like there's tons of information in here. And then this is kind of, you know, the basic foundations to do any programming and mainly for Python programming language. All right, so let's get started. So first topic we're going to cover is how can we do basic mathematical operations? All right, all right. So here, what you guys can see here is that in the Jupyter Notebook, what I tried to do is that I tried to include text along with the codes. So here in these cells, we'll be able to go ahead and actually write lines of code. So any lines of code in here could be actually executed, okay? However, here, these are not actual codes. These are what we call it markups, markdown, all right? Or markdown cells. So if you actually click here on any of these cells, you will find that they are listed as markdown, all right? Another option is that you list it as code. We're not gonna be using, you know, raw or heading. Mainly, we're gonna be focusing on code and markdown. So mainly, here, the, all these are markdowns, which means if here, for example, I came and said, okay, hello, for example, hello world, all right? Well, you guys can see here, this is listed right now as code, all right? So if I try to run it, you know, it's fine that there's an error telling you invalid syntax because it doesn't mean anything to Python. However, if I go here and I change that cell to markdown, all right, and I run it, 
then you will see that it actually becomes kind of you know like a like a heading or a, or a title okay so you guys can hear that, that means that python we're not going to be executing any of the lines in here all right okay so what we could do is that we wanted to delete this cell to delete any cell you you come here you press here and then you press double d okay you press d d so d d okay that will remove the entire um, entire cell if you wanted to add a new cell, you can press A, that will create new cells in here. Delete them, I'm gonna go press DD to delete different cells. All right, let's get started. So first, let's assume that we wanna perform kind of you know basic addition. Actually, Python is very intuitive. It's actually very easy and simple to use. So what we could do, if you wanted to add any two numbers, you can simply go and just write any two numbers and add them. Let's give it a shot. So let's assume again, I wanted to add, let's say five plus 10. So it's gonna say five plus 10. All right, it's like, you know, writing in a calculator. And if I wanted to run that cell, what you could do, they can press shift and enter. Shift and enter mainly goes here and run this cell. That means it actually executes the cell and generates an output for you. So if you press shift and enter, you will see that the, this Python is replying back to you, kind of telling you, okay, so five plus 10, that's actually is, means 15, all right? Okay, it's pretty, uh, pretty simple. If you wanted to subtract two numbers, again, you can perform subtraction. So let's say if I want to subtract 5 minus 10, all right, and you run it, shift enter again, that will give me minus, minus 5, okay? If I want to perform multiplication, then you can say 5 times 10. Again, I'm going to stick with these two numbers per se. And shift enter, that will give me 50. Just Python again will apply back with the answer right away. Again, it's like a calculator in a very simple form. If I wanted to do division, again, you can, you know, like divide 5 and then back like kind of a slash and then you press 10 you run it that will give me 0.5 which is you know kind of the answer all right if i wanted to create again new cells we're going to press a that will create new cells for us if i wanted to here i'm just trying you know these different um kind of operations okay i try to summarize all the operations here for you so here again if you want to do addition you know i'll cover addition cover subtraction multiplication division what if i wanted for example to cover let's say like floor division all right, so let's give it a shot. Floor division, okay, so if I wanna divide, for example, let's say 10 divided by five, okay, if I run that, that will give me two, but if I do floor division, which is divide like kind of two backslashes and I run it, that will give me two as well, all right? So here you, we don't see the difference. However, if I change that and make it 11, all right, and if I just make it one division only, if I run it, that will give me 2.2, all right? which means, you know, like it give me the actual fraction in here, fraction, fraction value. However, if I do the double division here or double, double um, however, if I wanted to do the 11 kind of, you know, like um, floor division, as you guys can see here, if I do double, double or like backslash, backslash five, and I run it, that would give me two, which means it's just giving me the quotient value. It's not giving me the actual remainder as well. All right. This is just the overall uh, idea of using it. We're not going to be using it much. But what we're going to be using extensively is what we call it mod or modiolo here, which is A mod B, all right, which is A percentage B. This is very important, all right? So let's assume that I wanted to, let's say, divide again 11 divided by 5, all right? If I run that, that will give me 2.2. However, if I do 11 modiolo, which is percentage sign, 5, if I run it, that will give me the actual remainder value, okay? Which is simply, if you divide 11 by 5, that will give me 2. All right, and there is a remainder of one. That's kind of the remainder out of it, all right, out of the actual division uh, operation. Okay, so the remainder here is important because that will help me in the future to identify if that number is even or if that number is odd. So, for example, so number 11, we know that that number is odd, right? So if I divide number 11, okay, by let's say two, for example, and I run it, all right, that would give me five as the... Um, at the quotient, however, it will give me one as a remainder, all right? So if I wanna do any test to, to see if that number is even or odd, I can simply divide by two and get the remainder. If there is a remainder, in this case, that means that number is odd. However, if there is no remainder, if the remainder is zero, that means that that number is even, which is pretty, pretty cool. So let's give it a shot. Let's assume that we have, for example, number 10. If I divide 10 divided by two, get, take the remainder if I run it, I know that 10 is divisible by two, which means 10 divided by two, that will give me five with zero remainder. Then I can tell, okay, this number is actually even, all right? Let's give another example. Let's divide 15 by two and take the remainder. If I run it, that will give me remainder one. 
which means that that number is odd. Then by doing that operation, I can tell if that number is even or odd, which is pretty cool. All right. The next operation that we want to do is that we wanted to take, let's say, any variable, and we can actually add like a minus sign to it, you know, kind of negation, or we want to do negative, for example. So I can do negative, let's say, 10, and I run it, that will tell me, okay, that there is number negative 10, okay, which is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty simple. What if I wanted to get the absolute value? Actually, that's, again, pretty straightforward. I can do absolute, all right, A, okay, so if I take, for example, any number, absolute, and if I open brackets, and I write here, for example, minus, let's say, 50, and if I run it, that would tell me, oh, okay, so that the, actually the absolute of a minus value is actually 50 as well, okay? As you guys can see here, the absolute of minus 5, minus 50, is, it just returns the positive value out of it. What if I wanted to do the exponent? What if I wanted to take, let's say, A and get the exponent of it? So I can do this, let's say, if I wanted to perform, for example, 5, all right? And I do, I want to get the exponent, so I do multiply, multiply again, 2, if I run it, that will tell me it's that means kind of 5 square, and that will return 25, all right? Okay? What if I wanted to obtain, let's say, the, um, the square root, all right? So if I have an, an, like a number, and I wanted to obtain the square root of that number, all right? In order to do that, you have to import what we call it a module, okay? We're going to cover the modules in, in the future, but in order to import, kind of, you know, uh, in Python in general, we have different modules. If you wanted to, let's say, import, for example, like if you want to print um, uh, some, for example, graphs, there is, you know, specific modules are meant only for printing. If you wanted to do math operations, there are some modules mainly used for importing uh, operations. So here, because we're going to do math operations, we're gonna, what we're going to do is going to say, okay, import, right? We're going to list math. And that we're going to import kind of, you know, the module for to perform any mathematical operation. And what we're going to do here, we're going to say, okay, I need math, all right, dot, square root, all right, and then open bracket. And then going to say, let's say the number, then I wanted to get the square root for it. So square root of 25, if I run that, that would tell me, okay, well, the answer is 5, which makes sense. I know that answer. If I wanted, let's say, to get square root of 16, if I go here, make it 16, I run it that will give me 4, all right? That means I got the square root of that number, which is, again, to, to do that, you can go and just do math.square root right away. You have to actually import, again, the module math. Again, we're going to be covering tons of modules again in the future. That's pretty much all what I wanted to cover in this lecture. So in this lecture, kind of an introduction lecture, now we know how to perform addition, we perform subtraction, multiplication, division, get the floor, and get the modu modulo when we know how can we how can we use mode to get you know to indicate if that number is even or odd we know as well how to do negation or just to get negative value of any number how to get an absolute value as well of any number so if you have a negative number if you do absolute of that negative number that will generate you know return back the positive number now we know how to get you know to the power of which is 5 for example to the power of 2 that will give me the square value of 5 which is 25 if I wanted to obtain the square root, I can as well do it, but I have to import the math module and then perform math.square root and then pass along the number. That will generate back our uh, square root value. All right? And that's pretty much all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to cover what we call it the order of operations which is very important kind of concept when we're doing any mathematical operation, okay? The order of operation has kind of a different name and what we call it precedence, okay? Which simply describe which operation should be performed first, all right? Which is, you know, which one has kind of a higher priority compared to other operations. All right, let's take a look. So here we have kind of a table that shows the order of operations from the highest or the most important down to the least important, all right? Which means that first step or first thing that are gonna be executed if you perform any mathematical operation is simply if we do use these parentheses. That's the first, you know, highest, the highest priority item that we're gonna be performed. Followed by that, we're gonna be doing exponents, all right? And then followed by the multiplication and division, all right? And then the least kind of priority one is what we call it the addition and subtraction. These are the least one, all right? Okay, maybe it looks a little bit weird, or it's kind of the concept looks a little bit different here. But what we could do that we, if we once we go through a couple of mathematical, you know, kind of examples, everything will gonna be very clear for us. 
All right. Okay. So let's get started. So let's assume that I wanted to, for example, sum two numbers together and then the result of that summation, I'm going to multiply it by a new number. All right. Let's take a look. So let's assume that I wanted to, for example, add one plus two. Okay. So I'm going to perform one plus two and then multiply whatever the result by three. Okay. So if I run this, that will give me nine, which means that because here I put the, these parentheses, which means I'm asking or I'm requesting kind of, you know, Python, okay, to do this operation first. Why? Because the parentheses has the highest precedence, okay? So here, what happened is one plus two, we're going to become three. And then the result of this, we're going to be multiplied by three. And that's why we got here the result of nine, all right? Let's assume that, for example, you know, I don't know kind of the order of operation. And I said, okay, I'm going to do one plus two times three. And I'm not going to do the parentheses, okay? If I run this, you will find that you come up with a completely different answer. You're going to come up with number seven, okay? All right, I hope you guys captured it or, you know, like at least um, knew what happened. So what happened here is because I didn't do or I didn't put these parentheses, what happened is that the multiplication has been performed first. Why? Because multiplication has higher precedence compared to the addition and subtraction. So we perform multiplication first. So three times two happened first. And then whatever the result, we're going to be added to one. And that's why you come up with the number seven here. Okay. Which means that if you are doing, if you're going to perform any mathematical operation, you need to make sure the order of operation just, you know, can generate completely two completely different results to each other. Okay. If you wanted to perform any mathematical operations first, just do, do the parentheses and then you're going to be safe. That means this is going to be operated first for sure. All right. Let's take a look at a couple of other examples. So let's assume that I wanted to take, let's say 16, all right, divided by four. Okay. And then I'm going to do summation and then I'm going to do 25 divided by five. Okay. All right. So, Simply put here, what do you guys expect? So first step is that we're going to do multiplication first and division first. So 16 divided by 4, that would be 4. 25 divided by 5, that means 5. And then 4 plus 5, the addition is going to be performed after. So if we run it, then we're going to come up with a number 9. Okay? Why? Because again, 16 divided by 4 plus, so division happened first, division happened first, and then the results of 2 we're going to be basically added together. And that's why we come up with number 9. All right, let's assume I'm going to copy this and copy, paste, control C, control V. And what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to add, let's say, parentheses here, all right, between these two. All right, again, I didn't change anything. I just put parentheses. What do you guys expect? Do you expect you're going to get number nine again? All right, obviously not. So if we run it, come up with 0.111, which is two completely different number. Why? Because what happened here is that because I put these parentheses, and since parentheses has a higher kind of precedence compared to the division, so what happened is I'm going to do the parentheses first. So here I'm going to come up with number 29. So I'm going to divide 16, divided by 29, and then the results were going to be divided by 5 after. And then you come up with that number, 0.111. All right? Okay. And that's pretty much kind of a quick overview of what they mean by order of operation or precedence. And that's pretty much all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to cover what we call it variable assignment, okay, which is kind of a very important concept in programming in general, and it's a very important concept in Python programming specifically. And we're going to be using it kind of extensively throughout, uh, throughout the course and throughout the practical uh, projects as well moving forward, okay? So let's zoom in a little bit so it could be clear for you guys. So what we're going to do here in order to perform variable assignment, first, what do you mean by variable assignment? So let's assume that I wanted to, for example, multiply two numbers together. So I have two options. The first option is I'm going to say 10 multiplied by 5, and then I can run this cell. That would generate 50, okay? The only problem is that in general, in programming in general, we just don't like this, you know, doing this. We don't like just multiplying two numbers and, you know, like don't, like, you know, instead of using these two numbers just to multiply them directly, we prefer to actually put these numbers in what we call it variables, which is kind of a tank. Think of it as kind of a tank and we put whatever, you know, like value in that tank and then that we can perform whatever we want on these variables or that tank moving forward. All right, let's take a look at an example. 
So let's assume I wanted to perform the exact same operation, but just kind of in a different, kind of a more, you know, like um, elite way or, or elegant way. I'm going to call a variable, call it A, and then I'm going to put equals to, and then I'm going to put 10 in it, which means I define the variable called A, and I put number 10 into it. So if I run this cell, actually you'll see that the cell has ran already, but nothing happened. Why? Because you didn't perform any operation. You just put 10 into A. If I wanted to view A, if I wanted to look at A, then I can write A and run. That will tell me what's in A, which means there is value of 10 inside our variable A, which makes complete sense. Okay. What if I wanted to define another variable called B? So I'm going to define B equals to, let's say, 5. Okay, and I run it. Okay, nothing happened. But if I look, take a look at B and I run it, that will tell me, okay, well, num B has number 5. What I could do right now is that I can do what we call it mathematical operations, exactly the same as we have done before, but in a kind of in a more elegant way. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to say, okay, C, which is a totally new variable, equals to, let's say, A multiplied by B. So instead of directly multiplying 10 times 5, what I did here is just to multiply 10 by 5, okay? But I did that in kind of in a variable assignment format. And instead of multiplying the numbers directly, I'm going to multiply the very actual variables, which is A and B, which is already contains 10 and 5 as well, right? So if I run that, nothing again happened. But if I view C, if I write C and I run it, then you will come up with value of 50, which is exactly the same as the value that we have obtained before here, which is great, okay? So what's the, what's the value? What's like, you know, well, what did we gain here? What we gained here is flexibility, okay? So now... I can actually put whatever value in my tank, which is, you know, kind of these variables A and B, and can perform whatever operations on them. I don't go have to go and write them again, right? So what if I can do here, and I say, okay, let's say D equals to, let's say, A plus B. I can do that. So instead of multiplication, I can divide another variable and just add them together. Run it, and if I want to view D, if I run it, that will tell me 15, which makes sense. Now I added 5 plus 10, this generated 15. Great. So what I'm going to do here, again, I'm going to show you two more important concepts. First one is that we wanted to get kind of what we call the type of uh, the variable, okay? So we have different types in general when it comes to programming. Here, I'm just going to cover the basic one, which is what we call it integer, okay? So if I wanted to, let's say, get the type of A, which is I defined before, here I put A, I put 10 into it. So what I could do here, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to want it to get what's the type, so I'm going to type type, and then open brackets, and then I'm going to say, what's the type, let's say, of D, for example, or of A, for instance. I'm going to say type of A. So if I run that, then, you know, Python is going to reply back to me and tell me, okay, actually, actually, this is an integer, okay, which means, which makes sense, because here I defined A as 10, all right? What if I, for example, here, and I said, okay, no, I'm not going to put 10. Actually, I'm going to put 10.5, okay? I'm going to define another variable called, let's say, E equals to 10.5 and run this cell. And then I'm going to go ahead and get type of E, all right? And if I run that, then you'll come up with something weird, you know, like a totally different uh, data type, which we'll call it float, all right? Which means that because here there is kind of a fraction in here, so it's not integer anymore. We call it in general, in programming in general, because just computer engineering, we call it float, which means that there is a fraction number of fraction element in here. There are tons of, you know, data types. There are strings, there are lists, there are, you know, like sets, there are tuple, there are tons of them. I'm going to cover all of them. Here, I just wanted to get, get just a quick overview of integers and floats. Simply put, integers, just number without any fraction in it. Here, float is that when there is a kind of a fraction. Is here 10.5, then that, that means this is a float, all right? Okay, let's add the new cells. Again, I'm gonna press A to add new cells. And what I could do here, the last concept I wanted to introduce is that if, let's assume that I wanted to, for example, um, take a number or take a variable, let's call it Y, for example. I'm gonna call Y, let's say, equals two, six. Okay, and I run it. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to increment that variable or that variable Y by one, okay? So, again, simply put, I wanna take Y add one to it, and then put the new value, which is supposed to be seven, again, back in Y. I can actually do this by saying, okay, I want it to Y plus one, again, okay, very simple. 
and whatever the results I'm going to be getting here, I'm going to put it again into y. All right. So that means the y old plus 1, whatever the result, I'm going to put it in what we call it y new, which is kind of an overriding the actual var variable again. So if I run this, okay, and if I view y, write y and run it, that will generate me 7, which means that I, I took 6, added increment to 1, and then overwrote the value of y again. All right. What I wanted to show you is that there is kind of, you know, like a, like a kind of a professional way, you know, of writing the increment operation in Python and it actually it's so many different programming languages that I've been exposed uh, to. What you guys can do instead, I'm going to say, okay, y, okay, plus equals one, which is really strange, okay, which is, looks, you know, looks really weird. Why it look, looks like kind of, you know, a syntax error, or like, you know, like something, you know, something is wrong. Actually, this means that y, this means this, which means y plus equal one means y equals y plus one, which means take the old y, add one to it, and then generate a new y. If I run it, and if I view y, if I go here and said y and run it, then you can come up with value of eight. Why? Because you actually took seven, added one to it, and then generated eight afterwards. All right? And that's, again, kind of a quick overview of what we have done so far. So for the variable assignment, now we know instead of just multiplying two numbers together, then we can put a number into a variable, another number into a variable, and then can perform operations on these variables, right? Now I know two data types so far. I know how do we do integers by getting the type of any variable, and then I can come up with integer. Now I know what we mean by float, if we have some fractions. And here, I, I know as well, how can we increment um, a variable within Python by, you know, just assuming y plus whatever number you wanted to do and then override that value on y. Another alternative is if we wanted to do y plus equal 1 or y plus equal 2 or whatever the value that we wanted to do, that means y old, take y old, add the number to it and then put it on y new. And that's pretty much all what I have for this section. Again, you're getting closer to mastering Python. Keep it up. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to show you kind of a quick overview of the exercise questions for this section. So uh, again, here, uh, these exercises are mainly dedicated for the topics that we covered so far. They are variables, data types, mathematical operations, precedence, which is kind of an order of operation, and then how to perform variable assignment, okay? So again, I'm going to walk you through a quick overview of the code, okay? Just, you know, like, um, of the questions. I hope you guys are going to, you know, kind of attempt to solve the questions. Again, if you can't find, if you can't solve any of these questions, uh, that's totally fine. Just, I'm going to include um, a video right after this video that includes, you know, all the solutions. I'm going to walk you through all the solutions in a great details. Okay, again, if you go to any of the um, of the folder here, you guys are going to find for any topic, for example, you'll find that there is 2A, B, and C. There is the concept, which is, you know, introducing the concept, you know, like we're going to cover, for example, print operation, followed by the questions, and then followed by the solutions. Okay, so now I'm in the first topic, which is 1B for the exercise questions. Okay. So here, for example, I'm asking you, okay, what will this code generate? So again, I don't want you to run the code. I'm expecting you guys, you know, if you run the code, obviously you can you know what the code will generate. Here, I'm just asking you, okay, tell me what, what do you expect, you know, based on your understanding of programming in general, which one should it be? Should it be 10, 20, or 15, okay? I'm asking you, okay, what's the type of X, for example? I'm asking you, if let's say if we divide X by Y and we put that in Z, what will gonna be type of Z? Again, please don't run the cell I mean, here I'm expecting you just, you know, maybe write on a piece of paper on the side, what do you expect to see? And then, then you run it and then you, um, you, you know, just make sure that you understand the difference between, for example, integer and float and so on. Next question here, I'm asking you, okay, given the area here of a rectangle, you know, which is, you know, area um, uh, of two sides, sorry, A and B, I'm asking you to write a code that calculates the area and perimeter of a rectangle, okay? And then I'm asking you to assume any values for the length and width. So you can define, again, any variable, put A, whatever value, B, whatever value, and then you can, I want you to calculate the area and calculate the perimeter. That's it, okay? And then you guys can write the code here. Here, I'm asking you, okay, what will this code generate? Okay, so I'm defining a couple of variables. 
and here I'm, the idea is to try to test you on the precedence. Okay, which operation can I be performed first? Again, please don't run the code because if you run it, you know, then there's no point, right? So here I'm just what I'm asking you to do is simply to run to run this code here. Okay, so here simply I'm just wanted to show uh, this is going to be E and this is going to be E. So here I wanted to simply run this. Okay, come up with an answer. Run this. Come up with an E answer, and then here. We're gonna define that as Z, and then I want you to tell me, okay, what what's Z value we're gonna be look like, okay? All right. Here, I want you to write the code to test if a number is even or odd, okay? Please try to check and review the mod, okay, operation, and it's again, it's very simple lines of code that we can tell me if the number is even or odd, okay? Okay. And then question number five: I'm asking you to write a code that takes a number, square it, and then take the result and get its square root afterwards. Okay, so just to take a number, perform the square, and then get the square root of the result. Be pretty much, you're going to end up with the original value that you had before in the beginning. Okay, that's the kind of, you know, a quick check for you. Question six, I'm asking you to simply write a code that takes the dimensions of a cube, which is the cube here, okay, and it obtain its area and volume. So you're going to define a value A, put it whatever, and then basically multiply, get these two equations, area and volume, okay. Question seven, I'm asking you to write a code that takes a number and increment it three times. So again, you can increment it with the basic, you know, idea that we had before or with the special, you know, like y plus equal one, for example, y plus equal three, for example, okay? All right, question eight, I want you to tell me what went wrong. Okay, so something went wrong here and I'm asking you to adjust the code so the answer here or the value of z will be equals to 55, okay? All right. Here, question nine, I'm asking you to write a code that performs the following mathematical operation. Simply, I wanted to get z equals to the absolute value of x minus y, multiply the answer by x plus y, okay? Again, kind of a quick exercise for you to know what you mean, how to perform absolute and how to multiply to perform multiplication operation, okay? All right, here, I'm asking you to simply go through again this is i didn't cover that mainly in the concept lecture here is kind of you know more additional reading for you okay here there are some kind of restrictions on some of the variables you know that so you can't just go and name value variable whatever you want you can for example name a variable we we'll call it if for example why because if means something else for python okay so these are kind of what we call it reserved words so you're not allowed to use these words okay so here I'm asking you, okay, go through these values and tell me which one should be removed. And again, go here to the print here and remove the values, you know, so basically this code will run. So if you run it right now, you will see that tons of errors will gonna happen. Okay, try to remove, for example, see which one should be removed from here, which one should be kept, all right? And then here in the print, update the print again command by removing the values that, you know, that you think should be removed here to perform or to execute this cell successfully all right again uh, section uh, question number 11 so i'm asking you to write a code that takes celsius temperature and convert it to fahrenheit simply put here we have again if you guys are not familiar in general there are kind of two kind of uh, there's a metric system and there's another kind of you know system in general that we we use you know compare if you are living in us or canada or whatever so there's kind of a conversion between celsius temperature and fahrenheit temperature Okay, so for example, if there is, let's say, 20 degrees C, okay, that's equivalent to 68 Fahrenheit. If it's, let's say, 0 degrees C, that's equivalent to 32 Fahrenheit. So the equation is this, okay? So what I'm asking you to do is to simply write a code that takes any Celsius temperature, you know, maybe pick any Celsius temperature in here, and obviously implement this equation so you can convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit value, all right? Okay. Again, all these codes are, you know, like they are simple, but they are very useful, right? Because now you can actually use it, you know, in practice to like f to perform that conversion. You, call, you know, so it, like instead of actually implementing that equation mathematically, if you write that code, then you can refer to it and, you know, and, and make use of it, basically. And then moving forward, what I'm going to show you is that, you know, we're going to learn how to take input from the user. So if you run a code, you can actually develop an application. And within that application, you will prompt the user to enter that value. So you don't have to actually put that value in here, okay, and define it beforehand. You're going to take that value as an input from the user 
perform the mathematical operation on it, and you can actually even print it to the user afterwards in Fahrenheit, you know, which is you know, very completely uh, interesting and functional code moving forward. Question 12, and the last one, I believe, okay, which is I'm asking you to write a code that converts from kilometer per hour into miles per hour. Okay? And I'm asking you to refer to this equation here below. So I want you to simply assume any value for kilometer per hour. If you guys can see here, again, you know, for let's say if it's, for example, like 85 or 90, for example, kilometer per hour, that's equivalent to around 55 miles an hour per se. Okay? So what I'm asking you to do is, again, simply put, implement this equation in a very simple form, which is, again, you're going to come up with a functional code that converts from kilometer per hour into miles per hour, and you can do it as well vice versa, obviously, moving forward too. And again, in the future, we're going to learn how to prompt the user to input the value in kilometers per hour, perform the operation, and then print it in mile per hour. All right? And again, hopefully, once you guys finish these exercises, you're going to become familiar with how to define variables, how to perform variable assignments, perform precedence, and basic mathematical operations, okay? You should be proud of yourself once you complete that. Even again, if you, if you, if you get stuck, no problem. Just go and refer to the Solutions Jupyter Notebook and the Solutions as well um, uh, video lectures, all right? And that's pretty much all what I have for this section. Good luck, and see you guys in the Solution section. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're gonna go through the solutions, mainly for the, um, for the uh, questions that you guys had regarding the variable, uh, variable data type, mathematical operations, precedence, and variable assignment, all right? Okay, so let's take a look at the first question. So what will this code generate? So here I'm asking you, what do you guys expect? So simply put, if we guys recall, how do we do variable assignment? So here we put 10 into x, and then here, we put 20 on top of x again, which means that we overwrote what we had before. And then we'll put 15 on top of x. And then I'm asking you to print x to tell me what's happening with x. So obviously, what you guys are going to see here, okay, again, without even running the code, that x will have the latest value or the most up-to-date value, which is 15. All right? Let's run it. So when you run it, you actually come up with 15, which makes complete sense. Perfect. I hope you guys were able to... Uh, figure that out on your own. The next question that I'm asking you to do is I wanted to get the type of X. If you guys recall, we had integer data type, we had float data type. So here, because we put 10 into X, okay, or we put 15, which is the most up-to-date value, into X, if I'm asking for the type of X, we should be expecting an integer value, which makes complete sense again. All right? Perfect. All right, so here I'm asking you to get, okay, what about z equals to x divided by y? Okay, so if I take x, which is the most up-to-date value, which is 15, okay, if I divide it by y and I put it in z, okay, and then I wanted to plot what's the value of z, if I run that, that will tell me, okay, there is a problem. Actually, name y is not even defined, okay? So what I'm asking you to do, okay, I hope you guys as well were able to figure that out, it's just go here and write, let's say, y equals to, let's say, 3, for example, all right, before doing this, before actually running this, okay? If I run it, that will tell me the result of z would be equals to 5. And then I'm asking you to write, okay, what's the type of z afterwards? If I run that, that will tell me, well, the type of z is actually float, which means, because here I'm performing kind of a division, here, even again, if you take a look at the number, you see that the number is becomes 5.0, which means there's a frac kind of a fractional element associated with it. And that's why here the type becomes float instead of actually having an integer value. Okay? All right? Okay, great. Perfect. The next question that we have is we wanted you to write a code, and that code will simply take A, take B, and basically calculate the area and the perimeter of our rectangle. So these are kind of the simple uh, calculation here. And I'm asking you to just assume any values for A and for B, okay? All right, let's take a look. So here I'm asking you to define A and define B. So I'm going to say, okay, let's say A equals to, let's say, 2, for example. I'm asking as well B equals to, let's say, 3, all right? And if I run that, that will tell me, okay, now I ran A and B. I put 2 into A and I put 3 into B. And then I wanted to define, again, a value called, a variable called area. And inside my area, I'm going to put A multiplied by B, okay? 
if I run that, that will tell me basically, then you will say the cell has been ran already, but I don't see anything because I didn't plot it. So I'm gonna copy, I'm gonna paste, I'm gonna run it. That will tell me my area will be equal to six, which makes sense. If I wanted to add a couple of new cells, I'm gonna just do A, that will create more new cells. So that's kind of, you know, half of the question. The second question is, I wanted to calculate the perimeter, which is two times bracket or parentheses A plus B. Let's do that. So I'm gonna say, okay, you can call it perimeter. Here I'll just call it per, for example, or perimeter equals two. I'm gonna say two multiplied by, and that's very important. If do not, please do not write A plus B. Okay, why? Because according to precedence, if you do that, that means you're gonna do multiplication first and then the result will gonna be added to B, which is not true, okay? The key element here is that you need to add the parentheses. It actually has been listed as well here as kind of, you know, a hint for you guys when you are um, calculating the perimeter anyways. So here we're gonna do again two times A plus B, okay? That would calculate my perimeter. If I run that, and if I wanted to, let's say, view the perimeter, I run it, that would give me a value of 10, okay? Which is basically the perimeter if I have the two sides, two and three. You guys, again, can come up with any values in here to come up with whatever values, but that's kind of, you know, the pretty much standard um, answer. Um, this is kind of the brain behind it when you do this. Once you have these that are, are right, then you're good to go. Then you answer the question right, okay? The next question I have for you is what will this code generate? What do you guys expect here? So here I defined a couple of variables, x equals 25, y 20, z equals three, and f equals two. And I'm asking you to obtain the answer, okay? What is the answer of x minus y times z divided by f, okay? Again, uh, obviously I'm not asking you to run the code because if you run it, that would just simply can generate where the values. But here, what I'm asking you to do, just give me like, what do you expect? Even on a calculator, from a, on a calculator. It's just gonna multiply again. Uh, first, you're gonna do the parentheses first, right? So you're gonna do X minus Y, so 25 minus 20, that will generate five, right? And then multiply the value of five by Z, which is three, and then divided by F, which is two, okay? All right, let's run it. Let's see what's gonna happen. So if I take that, okay, let's run this cell, let's run this one, and then if I plot the answer, that will generate 7.5, okay? All right, hope you guys were able to figure that out. Here, what I'm asking you to do is that I'm asking you, okay, beside this, what I'm asking you to add to kind of a parentheses here, it's exactly the same mathematical operation, but I'm adding parentheses here, okay? What do you guys expect? Actually, if you run it, you will come up with the exact same value, why? Because here the division is, has a same, pretty much the same kind of, you know, it doesn't really matter because if you, and once you add these parentheses, right, whatever value, if you multiply first and then divide, it doesn't really matter, okay? So the key element here is you need to add the parentheses here. That's what matters. That's what makes a difference, okay? Other than that, it doesn't really matter. Here, what happened is you took, you take the result, multiplied by Z, and then, or take the Z divided by F, and then multiply it as well, okay? They have this pretty much the same order, same precedence. Here it's pretty much the same. We're gonna generate the exact same result because there is no addition or subtraction which might, you know, like cause issues. What about here? If I do this, what's gonna happen is, is we're gonna again do this first and whatever the result, I'm gonna multiply it by Z divided by F, okay? If I run that, that would actually generate the exact same result, which makes sense, okay? However, if I go here, for example, I remove, let's say, X minus Y, if I run it, you'll come up with a totally different answer. Why? Because this will gonna be performed first, okay, which is parentheses, time, multiplication first, and then the result will gonna be subtracted minus x. Okay, that's totally different. However, once you have these parentheses here, okay, and you run it, then you're good to go, okay? Actually, uh, it's, it's, it's because I added here z as kind of part of the answer, that's why the answer is, is messed up. So that's why I need to go ahead and run them all again, and that's why you come up with the exact same answer, which is 7.5, all right? Okay, great. I hope you guys were able to figure that out as well. Okay, for question four, I'm asking you to write a code to test if a number is even or odd, okay? So let's assume they're gonna take just whatever number, say, okay, x equals to 20, for instance, and what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna do simply take the value of x and test if the number is even or odd. If you guys recall that we use the mod to give me the remainder value, okay? Let's refresh it. So if I take, let's say, the value of x and I do percentage, okay? And then divided by two, all right? That will give me whatever value of x will divided by two 
and it will give me the remainder. So if that number, which is in this case 20, is actually divisible by 2, the remainder will going to be equals to 0. Okay? So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to check, for example, on the value of y. So I'm going to say y equals to the remainder of this operation. Okay? Let's run it, let's run it, and let's plot or let's view y. Okay? So simply put, what I could do here is going to test, okay, if y or if the value here, the result of this operation is 0, that number is even. Okay? If that result here is 1, that means that number is odd. That's it. That's pretty much the test. Obviously, when we move forward and, you know, kind of, you know, uh, go through the code, kind of advanced topics, we're going to learn about if condition, okay, and how can we actually perform kind of a, kind of a conditional statement. Here, we didn't cover that, so here I'm just, you know, the overall idea is to take a number, divide it by 2, and test if the number is even or odd. If the remainder is 0, that means it's even. If the remainder is not equals to 0, that means it is odd. Okay, let's give it a shot. Let's assume that we're going to test it for 25. If I run it, 25, 25 divided by 2, get the remainder. The remainder will be y equals to 1. That means y because 25 is actually not divisible by 2. And that's why you come up with the remainder. That indicates that that number simply is an odd value. Okay? All right. Perfect. I hope you guys were able to figure that out as well. Okay. Here, I'm asking you, let's add a couple of cells first. And here, I'm asking you to write a code that takes a number square that number and then take the result and get its square root back again so simply you will end up with the exact same original value of that number okay let's take a look so let's assume i'm going to define a value called x i'm going to put let's say 4 into it and in order to get the square of the value if you guys remember what we did is that we take x and we do times times right and that will give me kind of this the 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 to the power of in a way okay so you're going to take x basically uh, squared right and that will gonna put it in a let's say a variable called y so here i'm going to call x equals four i'm going to run it and then i'm going to do four squared and that should generate y value if i run it 16 which makes sense now i'm asking you to take the result and get and get the square root of it so you will end up basically with the exact same number it's just kind of you know taking four Squaring it, you know, with the generate 16, get the square root, that would give generate 4 back again. Okay? Alright, if you guys recall, I cannot do the square root directly. I know that I have to, in order to do the square root, I'm going to say, okay, z equals to mass dot square root of my value, of my value y, right? But I can't do this. I have to import, if you guys recall, import the module, which is math first. Okay? Alright, if I run that, and if I wanted to view z, just going to list z here just to, to view it, that will return back again the value of 4, which makes sense. Took 4, squared it, took the result, got its square root, and that will generate the value of 4, which is pretty much the exact same value that I started with to, to, uh, from the beginning. All right? Okay. And that's kind of, you know, a quick overview of the first, um, uh, quick solution of the first question that we had. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And in the next lecture, we're going to keep going and we're going to finish the seven remaining questions. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to keep going and, you know, continue the solutions of the exercise, mainly for the variable assignments, precedence, and mathematical operations. So let's take a look. So here I'm asking you to write a code that takes the dimensions of a cube, okay, which is, let's say, A, and then obtain its area and its volume. All right? Okay. I hope you guys were able to figure that out. So here I'm going to define a value called A. I'm going to put, let's say, 20 into it, and I run it. That would generate A. Nothing happened. But again, I can go here and can view A. So the A equals 20, right? And what I could do, again, I need to add a couple of cells. Press A. That would add a couple of cells. And what I could do here, I'm going to calculate, say, okay, area equals to, it's 6 multiplied by A multiplied by A, right? So let's do it in a more simple or basic way. 6 multiplied by A multiplied by A. All right? Looks great. And I can take the area again. And I can actually view it here too. Run it. That will generate 2400. All right? That's okay. Looks good. If I want to get the volume, okay, what I could do, and I need to volume, is actually A cube. All right? So what I could do, I'm going to say, okay, volume, okay, equals to A, again, in a very simple form, times A, Again, times A in a very, very simple form, okay? 
if I run that, and if I wanted to view the volume, if I run it, that will generate 8,000, which is basically the volume of my cube if the side here is 20. If I wanted to change the side and make it, let's say, you know, let's say whatever, you know, let's say two, for example, I don't have to go and do all the all, all over again. I can just go and, you know, and run it, and that will kind of generate the update for me. It will give me the area and it will give me the volume afterwards. All right, sounds great. The next question that we have is I want you to write a code that takes a number and increment it three times. Again, you are free to choose whatever number you want. Okay, let's take a look. So here I'm going to say, okay, x equals to, let's say, 40. Okay, what I do is I'm going to increment it three times. If you guys recall, uh, you can do it in two, two, other, two ways. Okay, you can do it first. You say, okay, x plus equals to 3, right? Which means take the old x, add 3 to it, and the result will going to be the new x, which is 43. Okay, if I do that, and if I wanted to view X, if I run it, then it'll come up with 43. Okay, excellent. I can actually do it the other way around. I'm going to say, okay, X equals to 40, right? And I can say, okay, X old equals to X new plus 3, all right? And then I can view X. If I run that, that again will generate 43, the exact same answer. All right, that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, which is, you know, pretty, very, very simple, you can actually go here as well. Say, okay, I'm not going to add the 3, I'm going to add plus 1, all right? And then I'm going to come here, add plus equals, plus equals to 1, and then x plus equals to 1, which is obviously we're not going to go there, we're not going to do this anymore. Here it's just again because it's kind of, you know, the absolute, for absolute beginners, I'm going to say, okay, I took 40, add 1, add 1, add 1 to it, and if I run it, that will generate again the exact same answer, which means I took the first x, you know, updated, become 41, took 41, updated, become 42, take 41, 42, updated, become 43, and that's what we're going to do here, okay? All right, why am I explaining it this way? I'm explaining it this way because in the future, we're going to learn how to do for loops and while loops, which is, you know, we're going to take that command, and instead of writing it three times, I can just, you know, condense it in one command that does or repeats whatever operation for us several times, which is going to become really handy are really powerful in the future. All right? Okay. Let's take a look at the next example. So the next example that we have here is I'm asking you what went wrong. Add lines to the code so that Z becomes equals to 55. Okay? Actually, let's zoom in a little bit. All right. So here I'm asking you, okay, take the value of X equals 20, Y equals to 30, and I'm asking you to tell me what went wrong. Okay, so let's say, let's assume I, I don't know what happened here, and I run it. Will tell me, okay, something went wrong. Name S is not defined, which means I didn't define what S is. I've I've done an operation. I yes, I defined X. Yes, I defined Y, but I didn't define, okay, what's S? I didn't define that. Okay, so what I'm asking you to do is to simply go here and add a line. Okay, so simply define S. Okay, so I'm gonna define S here. Okay, so the answer will gonna become equals to 55. So I know that if I added x plus y, that would generate 50, right? So let's define s and put 5 into it, okay? Which means 20 plus 30 plus 5, that would generate 55. If I run that, then nothing will happen because I didn't plot z. But if I create a cell here and I put z, and if I run it, then you come come up with the answer 55, which is basically what I was asking you to do, okay? All right? Okay, the next question that we have here is I'm asking you to write a code that perform the following mathematical operation. I want you to simply take the value of z and simply get the absolute of x minus y multiplied by x plus y, okay? All right, how can we do that? So if you guys recall, we have done, let's say define any value values for x and y. I'm gonna say, okay, x equals to four, okay? And then gonna say y equals to, let's say two, for example. And then gonna say z equals to and what I could do to do absolute is, if you guys recall, it was ABS, just to do the absolute, open brackets. I'm going to say X minus Y, okay, that would be the first part. I'm going to do multiplication. I'm going to open another bracket. I'm going to say X plus Y, okay? That's basically writing the exact same equation as you guys can see here. And then here I'm going to plot Z. I'm going to view what's inside the Z. Let's run it. Let's run it. And that will generate 12, okay? which is simply put, here I got 4 minus 2, which is becomes 2, and then multiplied by 
6, which is 4 plus 2, and that will generate 12 for us, which makes complete sense. All right, great. The next question that we have here that I'm asking you to basically go through these kind of, you know, lines of code. Again, there's tons of information in here. Again, uh, and, the, and you guys are going to find this kind of common. That in the concept lecture, I'm not going to cover all concepts. Here, I'm just going to introduce, for example, in the exercises, some new concepts where you guys can, you know, do, for example, external research. Okay? So here, um, kind of, you know, introducing a new concept for you guys in the exercise is that there are kind of some restrictions in a variable naming. You can't just go and name variable whatever you want. These are kind of the allowable names. You can, for example, do underscore salary. That works. Yes, that's not a problem. Salary underscore. Okay, that's not bad. Salary 1, salary 2018, salary underscore KPH. You can do all these variables are, you know, valid. They are look great, okay? If you want to do all of them, you know, like kind of uppercase, that's fine. But bear in mind that salary lowercase is completely different variable compared to salary uppercase. These are kind of represent totally different variables, which means that you can go ahead and refer to them again, okay? You need to make sure that all the letters match okay so we'll then that means you're referring to the exact same variable okay okay what about the big no-nos what like you know what you shouldn't do what you shouldn't do is that you shouldn't start a variable with a number you can go and say okay let's say two salary that doesn't work or if you use any of the reserved words in here so here we have kind of a list of reserved words which is simply put a couple of words that we are not allowed to use like for example for from return, try, while, true, just don't use them. Why? Because they mean something else for Python. Python just use them, you know, kind of differently, okay? All right. So what I'm asking you to do here is to simply go through that code, okay, and try to see which one is allowed, which one is not, and make sure that the actual code run, okay? All right, so if we run it, you'll come up with, okay, invalid syntax. Tons of error, error will gonna show up. Okay, so first of all, salary equal 20, that looks great for me, you know, no problem. S uppercase, salary equals 25, not a problem too, but bear in mind that this salary is completely different than this. It's just totally two different variables, all right? Here I say, okay, 4 equals 10, okay? First, 4 is actually one of the reserved words here. So if you go up here, you will see that 4 is here, which is one of the reserved words, which is kind of, you know, not allowed to use. And actually, Python on its own, or Jupyter Notebook on its own, will, sh will highlight it as green, which means do not use. All right, which means in order to do that, you have two options, either to delete it or to do what we call it comment or commenting. What do you mean by comment? So actually, if you go here and do hashtag here, and if you do space, you will see that the color has changed, which means that basically this line becomes a comment, becomes kind of words that Python we're not going to be executing. It doesn't become a command anymore, which means that the code will going to go run, execute this, execute this, come here, doesn't do, doesn't do anything, just skip. Do this, do this, looks good. All right, do, zi, do this as well, looks good to me. Here, something is wrong. What was it? Basically, that we'd have started a variable with number two, which is, again, not allowed. That's one of the stuff that we are not allowed to do is that we started variable name with a number. We are not allowed to do this. So what we could do here, we can go and comment this. Okay, all right? Underscore salary, that works. True equal 20, okay? If you actually go up here, you would see true as one of the reserved words. You are allowed to use it. So what I could do here, I'm gonna come here, comment that out, okay? And salary underscore looks good. Underscore salary looks good to me. So actually, if I do run it, you will see, again, something is wrong. But you will see that the wrong here has nothing to do with any of that. It's actually in the print command, which makes sense because here I'm asking you to basically print something that's not allowed anymore. So what I could do, I'm going to copy this, paste it here. I'm going to go here, comment one of them, which is kind of the given. And I'm going to go here and remove the words that I don't, I don't need to. Okay, I'm going to remove four because I removed it from here. Go here, remove this one. I don't need it. I'm going to go here, remove true. I don't need it. And all that looks great. So if I run this, then you will come up with, perfect, you come up with all the values, 20, 25, 12, 13, 15, 30. Again, uh, here we just cover print. I'm going to show print simply. We're going to print, you know, stuff here on the screen. We're going to have an entire lecture on print moving forward. This is just going to kind of a quick exercise, a refresher for you guys, 
to exercise about variable naming and which ones are allowed and which ones are not allowed. All right. Okay, let's keep going. So the question number 11 is I'm asking you to simply write a code that takes Celsius temperature and convert, convert it to Fahrenheit. So what I'm asking you to take Celsius value multiplied by 9 over 5 plus 32 and that will give us Fahrenheit value. Okay. So what I could do here, I'm going to say, okay, C, for example, a value C, which is, stands for Celsius. Let's call it whatever. Let's assume it's 23, for example. Or let's say it's 20, all right, which is basically this value. So simply when you run the code, you should see that the result of the Fahrenheit value is actually 68, which is the conversion that we're looking for. So what I could do here, basically I'm just going to write the exact same equation. I'm going to say, okay, F, which stands for Fahrenheit, equals to 9 divided by 5, multiply the answer by C, right? And then what I could do, I'm going to add plus 32. Okay, let's make sure. Here we're going to multiply this first, which makes sense. The answer, we're going to add it to 32, looks fine. And here I'm just going to show F, which is what's Fahrenheit. If I run that, if I run that, if I run that, that will show me 68, which is exactly the same as we have here. Looks great. All right, let's take another point. Let's say, let's say I'm going to take 40 degrees C. I'm going to go here, change it, make it 40 degrees C. Run it, run it, run it, will generate 104, which is if you go up, you will see it's 104 Fahrenheit. Basically, this equation stands for the linear, um, uh, that linear line equation, simply. Okay, so, again, I don't want to go into ma the mathematics of it, but just, you know, here that's the intercept, which is, you know, like the intercept of the y-intercept, which is 32, and that's kind of the slope of the line, which is, you know, the delta y by delta x, which is 9 divided by 5 here. And that's kind of, you know, the simple conversion from Celsius temperatures to Fahrenheit temperature. Again, these codes are very useful. Yes, it looks simple, but you can actually do it and, you know, like execute it in reality. Like, you know, you can actually deploy it and use it for uh, whatever application you want. Moving forward, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how can we actually take that value instead of inserting here in the code, I'm going to ask you moving forward to actually ask the user to input that value. So we're going to ask the user to input, okay, what's, what's the temperature today? And the user input this, and they're going to print the Fahrenheit value for it moving forward. All right. The last example that we have is that I'm asking you to write a code that converts from kilometers per hour into miles per hour. And I'm asking you to refer to this equation below. Again, this is even simpler. So you're going to say, okay, kilometer per hour, we can call it whatever value you want. I'm going to say, let's say 90, which is, you know, like the value here that I actually can see here. Let's say it's 90 kilometers per hour. What I could do, and I say, okay, MPH, which stands for miles per hour, per hour, equals to exact same number, 0.6214, and I can multiply this by kilometer per hour. And then I'm here I'm going to show MPH, or mile, miles per hour. If I run that, run that, run that, that, that will generate 55.92. Actually, it looks pretty, this is actually real. This is actually like, you know, real value, or real, you know, image. So here it's around 90 kilometers per hour which stands for around 50, this is 50, this is around 55 miles per hour, which makes complete sense. Let's take another example. Let's go here and assume I'm going to do, let's say, uh, pick for example, 180 kilometers, for example. So I'm going to say, okay, 180 kilometers per hour, run that, run that, run that. That will generate actually around 111 miles per hour, which makes complete sense. All right? Okay. So again, now you should be familiar with variables, variable assignments, precedence, and basic mathematical operations. Great job. You guys should be proud. I hope you guys enjoyed that section and see you in the next section. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to discuss the print operation and how to get data from the user using the input command. All right. These uh, kind of, you know, two uh, concepts, they are very kind of uh, important because that's how you're going to, you know, like develop a Python code that can interact with the user. You can actually print something to the user and get data as well from the user, okay, which is pretty interesting. Now you can actually take, you know, kind of your code to the next level and do like really fun stuff with it, okay? So now we are at 2A, okay, which is in the concept section. And we are uh, covering the print operation and how to get user data as well. All right, let's take a look. So let's assume that I wanted, for example, to print, let's say, you know, like a welcome message to, um, to a user. So what I could do, I'm going to say, okay, X, 
equals to whatever value, then you open, you open double quotes, and then you say, okay, let's say welcome, okay, to Python cores, okay? All right, so what you have done here is that you define the variable, and you put basically these kind of characters within that variable, okay? So if you run that, and if you actually go here and say x, what's x? That will tell you, okay, that's actually x contains welcome to Python cores, okay? If I wanted to get the type, actually, of x, right? We didn't cover that, you know, yet, but we're going to cover it in the future. If I show that, it will show you its actual string. str stands for string. So now we know that there is an integer, which is, you know, kind of, if you put, let's say, x equals 10. We know that there is float. If you put, let's say, x equals, let's say, 10.5, for example, when there is a fractional element. Or here, if I wanted to show a string value, which is kind of a series of characters here, okay? Again, the objective of this, basically, section is not to cover the strings because we're going to have a separate section completely just covering strings and all the string methods. But here, I wanted to simply show you how can we print data on the screen. All right. So to print data on the screen, what we're going to use, we're going to use the print. Okay, so we're going to do print, open, parentheses, and then you're going to list x, which means I'm asking Python to actually plot or print the whatever the value of x to the screen. If I run that, then you will find that the actual text here, welcome to Python course, without the double quotes. This is very important. Actually, it's just containing what's in between here that are going to be printed to the screen. All right? Okay, great. That's pretty much how can we print data. Just print, open bracket, and just print whatever value. Okay? All right. So the next concept that I wanted to basically introduce is what we call it the format method. Okay? Let's assume that I wanted to, yes, print data on the screen. Let's say, welcome, you know, to Python course. But I wanted, to, let's say, to specify a name here. I wanted to say, welcome, let's say, Mitch, for example, to Python course. Or welcome, let's say, Ryan to Python course. Or welcome, whatever, whoever here. Okay, how can we do that? How can we kind of, you know, kind of break here that string and insert data in between? In order to do that, we're going to use the format method simply to do this. Let's take a look. Let's assume that I wanted to print, for example, a welcome message based on a specific name. Okay, so I'm going to say, okay, name. I'm going to put, let's say, whatever name. You can insert your name, for example. Here, I'm just going to insert Mitch, for example. So here, I'm going to define a variable called name and put Mitch into it. All right, let's run it. And let's view what's inside name. If I run it, it'll tell me actually there is Mitch inside name okay sounds good now i wanted to print a welcome message to mitch to do that i'm going to say okay print okay open brackets or parentheses and then i'm going to do here i'm going to say okay i need double quotes as we've done before and write your welcome message so we're going to say welcome and again and then here i need to put something because here i need to put the name i'm going to show you how can we do that welcome something okay to this let's say python course all right okay the whole idea here is that I wanted to print something here, okay? In order to do that, Python has what we call it format, uh, format method, okay? What you could do here is that you can, if you put curly brackets, okay? So if you put these curly brackets, okay? It's, it's kind of a way that telling Python that, okay, you print whatever message, welcome to this Python course here, okay? And whatever here in this curly bracket, just put something in there. I'm going to pass it along just kind of very separately. Using a different method is what we call it format method. Okay? Okay, it looks strange, but once I write it, it will show very, it will show that's actually pretty simple. I'm going to do here, I'm going to say, okay, dot format. Okay? So after the quotes, I'm going to say dot format. And then I'm going to open parentheses again. I'm going to pass along whatever name that I wanted to list here. So this, basically, what I'm saying, telling Python to do is, is, okay, welcome, within the curly brackets, just pass along the name here, whatever value, just come here and put it here within these two curly brackets, and then continue along and say, okay, to this Python course, and that's it. Okay, let's run it, and you will see that's actually, that's exactly what we're expecting, welcome, Mitch, to this Python course. If I go here and say, let's say, change it to, let's say, Ryan, for example, if I run that, run that, run that, we'll say this actually welcome Ryan to this Python course. Perfect. All right. What's even interesting is that you can actually use the format method to print numbers as well. So I can say, okay, welcome, for example, you know, like, or say, for instance, my name is Ryan, for example, and I am, let's say, 20 years old or 25 years old or whatever. Let's see how can we do that. So what we could do here 
I'm going to say, okay, print, okay, open parentheses. And what we could do, I'm going to say, okay, double quotes and say, write whatever you want. My name is, and open curly brackets because I need to list here something. I'm going to show it again after the format, okay? And I am whatever the year is old, okay? All right. So now I know that I'm going to print, I'm going to do something here, right? I'm going to pass along something here. So I'm going to use the format method to actually do this. I'm going to say, okay, dot format, right? I'm going to open parentheses. I'm going to pass along, I need to pass a name, and I want to pass an age as well. So I'm going to pass a name, all right? And bracket, comma, I'm going to say pass along the age. But I didn't define the age yet. So what I could do, I'm going to go here, create a new, again, press A. That will create a new cell. And define an age, let's say, 23, for example. Okay? All right. And let's say I'm going to go back and change the name, make it, let's say, Mitch back again. And that's it. That's pretty much it. So you guys can see here, you can pass along an integer printed. And you can print as well a string if you wanted to. Let's take a look. Let's run this first, name. So now I have name Mitch, right? Here that would print just welcome Mitch to this course. Now I wanted to print a different one. I'm going to say age 23. I'm going to say print my name is whatever, and I am whatever years old. Let's run that. And that's it. That's pretty much what we're expecting. My name is, let's say, Mitch, and I am 23 years old, which is great. Now you can pass along whatever. You can change that, make it 25, run it, run it. Then you'll see that it becomes 25 years old. Okay? Again, the format method, we're going to be using it extensively. It's actually very, very powerful. We're going to use it throughout the course to print, you know, mix of strings, mix of numbers, mix of floats, mix of whatever stuff we wanted to print. Perfect. Let's take one last example before we uh, conclude the print. Let's assume that I wanted to print the value of pi. Are you guys, if you guys are familiar with the value of pi, which is three, you know, 3.14 that we use generally when we calculate the area, for example, of a circle, okay, which there's actually, there's a day, is called pi day. Okay, so what we could do here, I'm going to say, okay, I want it to print, let's say, print, open, parentheses. Okay, I'm going to say, okay, the value, the value of pi is, and open curly brackets, and here I'm going to say dot, after the after double quotes, I'm going to dot, format, open brackets. I'm going to pass along the value of pi, which is, let's say, 3.14. You can pass along whatever you want. Okay, if I run that, that will tell me the value of pi is 3.14. Perfect. That's exactly what I was expecting. All right. And again, let's go ahead and refresh again. Now we know how can we define a string. How can we go here and print an actual string? Okay. Sorry, here can we actually print the value of the string? Here we know how can we use the format method to pass along a name within a string? How can we print a name along with the age, for example, using again the curly brackets and the format method? And again, another example to plot the pi value. All right, and that's pretty much all what I have for this section. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And in the next section, we're going to cover how to get data from the user. All right, and see you guys in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to take data from the user using the input um, um, function. So let's take a look. Let's assume that I wanted to, for example, prompt the user to enter their name. Okay, and then afterwards, I'm going to print to the user, say, okay, hello, and then followed by the name that the user had just entered. Let's take a look. Again, the user, uh, get how to get user input, along with the print function, they are extremely important because they enable you to actually interact with the user, which is, you know, makes your code way more handy and way more actually practical. Let's take a look. So what I could do here, I'm going to say, okay, let's assume name equals to and what I could do, I'm going to use the input, okay, and open parentheses, and here, double quotes, and say, okay, what's, let's say, what's your name, for example, all right? So what is going to happen here, which is very powerful, is that you are asking the user to input, basically, value. First, I'm going to prompt data to the user. This kind of a command is kind of a mix. You are printing something on the screen. At the same time, you are expecting data to be fed, and whatever data is going to be fed from the user, we're going to be put into the variable name, which is very interesting. Let's take a look. So actually, if we run this, you will see that, you know, here the cell becomes, have an asterisk. So asterisk means that kind of the, the which is very important, that the code here is stuck, which means it's waiting for the user to input something. 
So what we have here is that what's your name, which is what you guys draw, uh, plotted here. And then here, the kind of the Python is just waiting for you guys to enter value here. So I'm going to say, for example, whatever. We're going to say Ryan, for example, you know, as a name. Okay. And you have to press enter. And when you, once you press enter, you will see that basically here, it doesn't become asterisk anymore, which means the cell has been executed successfully. And now if I take a look at name, if I run it, you will see that there is value of Ryan, which is the, you know, like the value that we actually entered as, um, as an input, which is really powerful. Okay. Let's assume that I wanted to kind of have a more interesting example. And let's assume that I'm going to prompt the users to enter their name and then followed by their age afterwards and then enter their address too, okay? And then gonna print to them, okay, my name is, you know, or your name is whatever, you are whatever years old and you live at that specific address, okay? Let's take a look. So what I could do here, I'm gonna say, okay, name, define any variable called name equals to, I'm gonna, because I'm asking the user to input value, I'm gonna use the input, again, function here, open parentheses, again, uh, double quotes, and say, okay, enter your name. All right, looks good to me. The next step, I'm gonna ask the user to input their age. I'm gonna say, okay, age equals two. Again, input, again, open parentheses, open double quotes, and tell them, okay, enter, enter your age. Okay, make it kind of, you know, maybe a little bit more pretty here, just add two columns here, okay? And then afterwards, I'm gonna ask the user to input their address. I'm gonna say, okay, address equals two, input, open parentheses, double quotes, Enter your address. Looks good. Looks great. All right. Columns as well. Looks great. Let's actually, let's run it and let's test it first. So I'm going to run it. Enter your name. So I'm going to say, let's say Ryan, for example. Let's say enter your age. You call it whatever. Again, 23, whatever. Enter your address. You're going to say, okay, um, for example, um, like um, Toronto, for example. Canada, whatever. Okay. I'm going to run it. And then you will see that everything ran, ran perfectly. So the cell has ran, and now I have name, age, and address has all the values that we want. Let's take a let's check if we print name. That will tell me there is Ryan in there. If I do the address, and if I run it, it will tell me there is actually Toronto, Canada. Looks great. Looks perfect. Okay. So what I could do here, and I wanted to print to the user that basically your name is whatever, your age is whatever, and you live at that specific address. Okay, let's take a look. So I'm going to say, okay, print, open parentheses. I'm going to say double quotes. I'm going to say, okay, your name is, open curly brackets, okay, you are whatever years old, okay, again, comma, and say, okay, you live at, and then curly brackets, and then you can pass along all that using this format method, if you guys recall. So after, after the double quotes here, you're going to say, okay, format, right? Open parentheses, all right? And then pass along everything in, in order. I'm going to say, okay, name. I'm going to say age. I'm going to pass along the address, okay? All right. I hope everything looks good. Let's run it. Let's run it again. Enter your name, Ryan again, 23 again. And then enter the address. Let's say, again, Toronto. Canada, run it, and then after we input that, you'll see, okay, your name is Ryan, you are 23 years old, you live at, for example, Toronto, Canada. Looks great to me. All right, that's exactly what we're expecting, okay? So now we know how can we prompt the user to input value, how can we take data from the user, how can we actually print it as well to the user. Okay, perfect. Let's take a look at another example. Let's add, you know, create a couple of new, um, new cells here. And let's assume that I wanted to ask the user to enter an integer, two integer values, and then print the sum to the user, okay? Let's take a look. So I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna, instead of having a string, I'm gonna ask the user, okay, to A equals two, okay? I'm gonna use input, all right? Open parentheses. I'm gonna ask the user, okay, enter a number, okay, for example, all right? And the user should enter a number, and that number should be fed here in a string, okay? In, in, a, in the value A. And then I'm going to ask you, okay, one more time. I'm going to copy paste. I'm going to go here, call this B. And I'm going to ask you to enter another number, okay? And what I could do here, I'm going to say, okay, print, open parentheses, open double quotes. I'm going to say, okay, the sum of, let's say, A and B is, open again curly brackets, come here to say dot format, 
okay? And here, I'm going to pass along them in order, A, and then B, and here I have two options, either to actually perform, let's say, the summation previously, so I'm going to say, okay, C, for example, equals to A plus B, I can do that, and can pass along here the value of C, and then simply I'm going to say, okay, the sum, let's say, of 2 plus 3 is, let's say, 5. That's what I was expecting, okay? Let's take a look. Let's run it and see what's going to happen. If I run it, enter a number. So I'm going to say, okay, 3, press enter, enter another number. I'm going to say, let's say, 2, press enter, and then you come up with that surprise. That the surprise is, yes, all that looks great, the sum of 3 and 2 is, this is the problem. What happened is here is that you simply, what it, what, like what Python did here, is that just it concatenates simply the strings. What do you mean by that? Simply, it just shows 3 followed by 2. It didn't actually perform the summation, okay? So why is that? Okay, that's actually very important because here we need to differentiate between string and integer values. So let's take a look. So what we have done here is that when I ask the user to enter a number, okay the user yes the user entered three but if we take a look at let's say the type of a and if we run it you will come up that's actually not an integer it's actually a string which means think of it as kind of you know it's a character okay again we didn't cover strings so far but this is not a number this is not a value that you can actually use to add to perform mathematical operation on it okay similarly put similarly if you do type let's say b and you run it you come up with again with a string too and that's why here, when I put A plus B, it just de it dealt with them as kind of strings, not as numbers. Okay, so how can we actually overcome this? We can overcome this by using um, or by converting the values that the user is going to imp be inputting here from strings to integers. Okay, let's take a look. So what I could do here, I'm just going to copy these two. Okay, exact same. I'm going to copy them here. And what I could do here is I'm simply going to convert from string to integer. Let's take a look. What I could do, I'm going to take the value of a, all right? So I'm going to say, okay, int, when I do int, open parentheses, pass along the value of a, okay? Then what I could do is you're going to pass along this, you're going to call it a underscore int, which means now I can convert from a string to integer value. All right, let's take a look. So if I actually run this, all right, uh, okay, before, okay, before running this, I don't want to confuse you. What I, could do, what I did here is just, I, let's copy that command, do it separately here. I just took the value of A and converted it to integer. Let's run this. And if I get the type of A underscore int, if I run it, you will come up with a value of integer, which means that simply now A is not a string anymore. If I actually take a look at A int, this actually you will see that we converted the value of three which was a string to a value of three but it's now it has a type of integer then you can do a mathematical operation on it all right okay if we go here again so I, again i don't want to confuse you we enter the number we put in an a a is a string now let's take a convert it from a string into an integer now it looks good now i'm going to take another number which is b which is again still string i have to do the conversion for b as well I go do, do b underscore int equals to int bracket b, all right? And then I'm going to do here a mathematical operation, not on a on b, but actually on a int, all right? Plus b int, great? And that will generate value of c. And that's it. That's pretty much all what I need to do. Then you're going to perform the actual operation, sum them up, and then you should be printing value of c, which is supposed to be the actual true summation values. Let's run this. Let's, we're going to run it. I'm going to say, okay, three, press enter, two. If you run it, you will come up actually with what you're expecting. The sum of three and two is five and instead of actually three, you know, concatenated or just next to two, which makes a complete sense. Let's run it again. Let's test, you know, let's say, for example, the value of 10 and value of 20. And if you sum with the summation of 30, it looks great. That's what we're expecting. And that's pretty much all what I have for this section. Again, you guys are getting closer to mastering Python. Keep it up. I hope you guys enjoyed that section and see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to cover strings. And um, just a quick introduction to strings. We're going to be using again extensively into the practical section of this course. 
and we're gonna again have tons of exercises right after we introduce the concept so here I want you to open just 3a concept strings here I just added like filming because here I don't have any commands but you shouldn't see the filming um, mainly comment here you should find 3a concept strings just to open the Jupyter notebook and I'm gonna walk you through it step by step okay so first so first of all what do we mean by a string so a string in Python is simply a sequence of characters. So if, if I wanted to, let's say, print, for example, let's say, hello world, for instance, all these series of characters that we print on the screen, we call them a string, which is kind of a data type. So now we know what they mean by integer, which is just a number. If we have a float, that means, you know, like a number with a decimal value in it, okay, with a fraction the element in it, in it, sorry. And we know that right now as well strings. Okay, let's take a quick a quick example. Let's assume that we want to define a variable called y. I'm going to call y equal, for example, hello world. All right. And if I run that, and if I want to view y, again, shift enter, that will tell me hello world. If I said, okay, show me the type of y, and I run that, that will tell me actually it was a string. Okay, which makes sense. All right. Okay. So what we could do uh, on these strings, let's assume that I wanted, for example, to, let's say, define first name, define last name, and I wanted, for example, to print the full name. Let's see how can we concatenate two strings. When I say concatenate, that means to putting two strings together, you know, next to each other. Let's take a look. So I'm going to define a variable. I'm going to call it first, underscore name, and I'm going to call it whatever, Mitch, for example. And then I'm going to define last, underscore name, and then here we're going to call it, um, let's say, whatever, Steve, for example. And then I'm going to define the full name, okay, full underscore name equals to, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, okay, it's first underscore name, okay, plus, all right, and then, and then I'm going to write, let's say, last underscore name, okay. Let's take a look what's going to happen. When I say plus, Okay, when you do plus here, and we're defining basically these two variables as strings, that means you're you are asking Python to just kind of do concatenation to each other, which means putting the two strings next to each other. If we run that, okay, and if we simply view full underscore name, if I run that, then you will find that there is Mitch, Steve, basically kind of, you know, like, like linked to each other with no space in between. All right, what if you wanted to, let's say, create a space? You, what you could do, they can actually put a space here. So if you run it and run it again, then you will find there is a space here. That's just one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is that if you wanted to keep the Steve like this, what you could do, then you can add or create your own string in here. You can add the plus, and then you can add kind of, you know, double quotes here and create a space, kind of, you know, an artificial kind of space in between. So if you run that, that, then you will find that there is Mitch Steve here, right? Okay, great. That's pretty much, you know, how can you define a string? Let's say, how can you, if you wanted to, let's say, print a string, what you could do, you can say print, and then you open, and then you pass along your full name in here. When you run that, then you will find that is Mitch Steve, and there is no quotes because that's the actual message or text that you want it to be printed on the screen. All right, perfect. Okay. What other stuff that we could do on a string? So what we could do, we can do tons of stuff on the string. Obviously here in this lecture, I'm, I want to be able to cover all the methods and all the kind of, you know, like functions that we can apply on a string. I'm just going to cover a couple of methods that are going to be useful for us. Let's assume that I wanted to take, let's say, our full name that we had here and turn it all to uppercase. For example, instead of having Mitch underscore Steve, for example, lowercase, we're going to make it all uppercase, so like cap capital letters, basically. How can we do that? What we could do is that we can take whatever variable, okay? So let's say take the exact same name, which is full underscore underscore name, and then you basically do dot, and then you specify, which is kind of apply. When you do dot, that means you're applying a method, okay? When you say, when he, now we're going to apply a method called upper, Okay, and you open brackets and just leave open parentheses, just leave it like this. Okay, then you are asking simply to take the full name and apply a method called upper on that variable, on that full name variable. Okay, again, we're going to cover tons of like, you know, like methods and object oriented programming moving forward. But here, this is just a quick overview. When we do that, then you will find that as Mitch Steve becomes uppercase. Okay, all right. The next example that we're going to do, or next method that we're going to do, is what we call it split, okay? Let's take full name, okay, again, full name, and apply a method called split. So we're going to say dot, and we're going to say split, 
and then open again parentheses empty parentheses if you run that you will find basically that here what you've got is that you've got kind of a kind of a square bracket here okay and then there is the first name on its own comma and then there is last name on its own what happened here is that you simply apply split method on the full name which is simply taking the entire string and returning it into series of words so that's why you obtain Mitch on its own and then Steve on its own and it's returned here as what we call it list okay I didn't cover a list so far but think of a list as kind of you know a series of numbers or series of strings so here there is a list okay full list like a shopping list you know you add for example you're gonna buy let's say you know like um, I don't know like like pants for example along with shoes along with mix of stuff here you can do it the same so you can list all the name all this stuff all the words and uh, they are separated by a comma in here okay actually if, you, if you're gonna do this let's say you're gonna call it for example my underscore list for instance and if I run that and if I wanted to view my list if I run it they're gonna come up with these if you're gonna check the data type we're gonna say type okay bracket parentheses I'm gonna take the type of my list if I run that then you'll come up with a data type that's called list which means again it's it's kind of a it's not a string it is not an integer it's not a float but it's actually a list which is you know a mix of stuff in there this you know kind of a, think of it as an array as well okay all right okay great okay so let's take a look at another example let's assume that I want it like you know for example let's add some couple of cells and let's assume that I wanted to for example define like a variable y equals to an email for instance let's say okay Mitch okay I'm sorry let's open double quotes Mitch and let's assume for example dot Steve at gmail.com okay which is an email all right and what I would do here is that I can actually split my um, my string in here okay here I split the string into different series of words okay because here I have words separated by space I can actually use a split as well method but I can specify where do I need to split let's assume that I wanted to split for example my string here based on the at so at the at I need to split it let's do that let's see how can we do it I'm gonna say okay it's z equals to okay y which is my variable okay and then I'm gonna apply the method method dot split open parentheses and I'm gonna do here I'm gonna pass along simply what I want it to split if you leave it empty then it will gonna be split based on the spaces based on you know like different words if I just do like you know like at that means I want it to split it at the at okay okay let's run that and let's run this and let's take a look at Z what happened with Z so we actually we're gonna come here with Mitch.Steve which is kind of you know your username or you have here and then you separate the at you didn't even obtain it and then you find gmail.com separated here again Z as well is a list okay so if you get again what's the type of Z if you run it then you come up with a list which is simply here the elements that we have here okay all right what if I wanted for example to obtain let's say the first element within the list or the last element within the list let's say I wanted to obtain Mitch Steve for example or let's say the gmail on, on its own again we're gonna cover that extensively when we cover lists in the future but here I just want to give you kind of a quick overview because we're gonna use it during the exercise what you could do is you can say okay Z all right square bracket and say zero which means because here I have a list kind of you know like an array of two elements I can access the first element within the list using its index so I'm gonna say okay I go to the Z obtain the element that has index of zero this is the element that has index zero which is the first element this is the index the element that has index of one and so on and so forth so a list starts with an index of zero one two three four and so on and so forth so if I say okay Z square back at zero if I run that then you'll come up with Mitch dot Steve okay all right what if I wanted for example to say okay Z for instance one if I run it then you'll come up with the second element which is you know gmail.com again we're gonna do that again extensively when we cover list here this is just a quick overview of how to perform a string and how to apply different methods on a string let's recap so now we know how can we define a string how can we obtain a type of the string okay which is gonna get come up with str basically as a data type 
How can we perform a string concatenation, which is simply just add plus, as if you're adding, for example, strings next to each other? How can we get the uppercase using upper method? How can we split a string using the split method? And how can we split as well based on a specific element, you know, at add, for example? And then here, how can we um, simply access different elements within the list by coming up with, you know, the first name or last name using the indexing Z0 for the first element and one for the second element, all right? And now you're getting closer to mastering Python. I hope you guys enjoy that section and see you in the next section. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to cover the list, which is a very important data type when it comes to Python programming in general, all right? So we covered before how to, let's say, define an integer. For example, if you, let's say, say x equals, let's say, 10. And if I run that, if I wanted to take a look at x, if I run it, it will tell me, OK, there is value of 10 within x. And if I want to go and just get the type of x, and if I run it, that will tell me there is an integer. All right. If I go and change that and make it, let's say, 10.5, run it, run it, run it, it will tell me, OK, well, that type is float. All right. If I change that and make it, let's say, whatever string, can make it like hello world, for instance, and I run it, run it, run it, that will tell me, well, that's an actually a string, okay? So now we are pretty much, you know, like kind of experts when it comes to defining um, various data types, again, such as strings, integers, and floats, all right? Now let's go to the fun part. Let's go and define what we call it list, all right? So list simply is kind of a collection of elements. So we can, for example, take a collection of, let's say, series of numbers. Instead of having just one single number, let's say five or 10 or whatever, we can create a list. Think of a list as kind of an array, which is kind of a series of elements, you know, connected to each other. Let's see how can we define a list first, all right? Okay, so I'm gonna define my list, all right? So here I'm just defining, can call it whatever variable you want. And to define list, we actually use a square bracket here. And then we list the elements in order. So we say, okay, that's the first element. Let's say the second element, and that's my third element. All right? And then we separate them with comma. All right? And if I run that, nothing happened. Everything looks good. If I wanted to view what's my list, if I run it, it will tell me, well, my list has elements 1, 2, and 3. All right? If I wanted to take a look and, let's say, get the type of my list, and if I run it, that will tell me the data type is actually a list, which is great. That was actually what I was expecting, okay? All right. What we could do, actually, is that here we define the list that has all integers in it. What we could do is that we can actually mix and match different data types within a list, which is, again, really, uh, very powerful when it comes to Python programming. So let's assume that I'm going to define, again, another list. I'm going to call it my list again. And then I'm going to initialize it with just a bunch of, you know, like data types. We're going to say, okay, let's define an integer, for instance. Let's put some string. Let's call it Mitch, for example. And let's, for example, say it 5, for instance. Let's run it. Okay, everything looks good. And if I wanted to view again my list, we're going to say, okay, my list. And run it. That would tell me, okay, well, that's basically the list that I've got. I can go ahead as well and print, if I wanted to print my list. And if I run it. That will tell me these are kind of the elements that we're expecting as well within our list. Great. All right, that's pretty much how can we define a list. And what we could do as well here is I wanted to show you that there is kind of um, an advanced form of a list is what we call it nested list, which is a list inside the list. Okay, I don't want you to be confused. Again, it's very simple. Let's see how can we define that. So let's assume we're going to define, okay, my list equals to, I'm going to again open square brackets. And then I'm going to say, okay, first element in my list is call it Mitch, all right? And then the second element, it won't be just a number. It won't be just a float, for example. It won't be such um, like a string. We are actually going to define a list inside the list, and that's what we call it nested lists, okay? So how can we define that? Actually, you can, again, create another list inside the list by, again, opening another square bracket, which means that's kind of, you know, like a new list inside my bigger list, which is I defined here. And then you call it whatever you want. Then here, you can simply go ahead and define it, let's say three, define six, and define seven. All right? You can run that, looks good. 
and I can go ahead and copy and paste, run it. That will give me, that's my, again, nested list. All right. So what we need to do here is that we need to do what we call it indexing, which is simply we want it to access a specific element. Let's assume that I want it, for example, to access number six or element here, that the value of six. How can I get this? We do that, but we call it indexing. Okay. Let's take a look at a very uh, simple example first. So let's assume we're going to just ignore the nested uh, list because you know it's a little bit complex we're just gonna take a look at just a simple one just again defining my list that has two Mitch and five and let's assume that I wanted to print for example let's say the first element here okay so what I could do I'm gonna say okay print open parentheses and then write the name of my list which is called my underscore list and in order to access elements within the list I open square brackets and then I specify a number here, which is what we call it index, all right? So the first element in my list has an index of zero. The second element in my list here, Mitch, has an index of one. And then here, the third element in my list has an index of two, which is a little bit confusing when it, when it deals with Python, but you're gonna get used to it afterwards. Again, so to access the first element, I just need here to come and put zero. And that will simply here is translated to, okay, go to my list and access the first ele element or the element that has an index of zero that's exactly what i'm looking for all right let's run it and then you'll come up with two which is the value here perfect if i change that and make it let's say one if i run it then you'll come up with mitch which is the value here that we're getting if i run two that will come up with five which is the value here that we're getting again please remember and don't forget that you know like when we do uh, indexing to a list the first element has an index of zero, this is an index of one, and this have index of two. Great. All right. Let's see how can we do what we call it nested indexing. So let's assume they're gonna define um, a list, okay? I'm gonna define it, whatever. I'm gonna say here, okay, my list equals two, again, open square brackets, and I'm gonna define, let's say, string first, Mitch, for example. And then here, I'm gonna create actually two lists. I'm just gonna come here and create two lists, okay? First list has values 3, 6, and 7. And then the second list has, let's say, another value. Let's call it yellow, like in the color for the instance. And then 5 and then 6. All right. If I run that, it looks good. And what I wanted to do is I wanted, for example, to print, let's say, the letter T here. Okay? Which is weird, but just, you know, let's assume they're just going to print here the letter T, for example. Or I wanted, for instance, to print, let's say, only yellow here. How can I access that? How can I do indexing for a nested list? Let's take a look. I'm going to say, okay, print, all right? And I'm going to call the name of my list, which is called my list, open square bracket. And if I listed, let's say, zero, okay, and I run it, that will give me Mitch, which is the first value here, all right? If I say my list of one, and if I run it, that will return the second element in the large, in the big, basically, list. And that's why you will end up with another list, which is here. Because this is the element that has an index of 1 in my big list. Yes, it's a list. That's a different topic. But, you know, the idea is, in my big list, this is, has index 0, this has index 1, and all that has an index of 2. Let's give it a shot. If we run 2, run it you'll come up with yellow, five, and six, which is great, okay? All right, let's assume that I wanted to access elements within the element. Let's assume that I, I just don't want to access, let's say, all this. I just need, for example, to get just yellow. How can I do that? So if I say print my list, and then open square bracket, and then I put value of two, that would return the entire list. What I could do here to do nested indexing, I can actually open another square bracket, and put index of zero. Simply put, I'm saying, okay, go to my larger list, take the element number two, which is simply all this, and then within this, get the element number zero, which is simply yellow. Okay, if I run it, you'll come up with yellow, which is great. If I change that and make it, let's say two, I run it, you'll come up with a value of six, okay? If I, let's say, I wanted to obtain this six, for, for instance, then I need, that's zero, all that is one, so which means I have to go here, make this one and inside my list I have this index 0 this is index 1 right so that's why I need to come here and make this of index 1 if I run it you will come up with a value of 6 here all right which is great perfect all right I hope it's not too confusing I hope it's pretty straightforward for you guys 
The next topic that we're going to be covering is what we call it negative indexing. Okay, what do you mean by negative indexing? Let's assume that I wanted to access, for example, elements from the end of my list. Okay, let's give it a shot. Let's assume that I'm going to just copy that here. Okay, and I wanted to obtain the last elements within the list. I can actually do that easily by saying, okay, print, and then I'm going to specify my list, and then open a square bracket, and within that square bracket, I'm just going to say minus one indicating that I need the last element within my list, okay? If I run that, if I run it, that will return the value of 5, which is simply the last element within my list. And that's how we do, uh, basically, um, uh, negative indexing, okay? If I change that and I make it, let's say, minus 2, that will give me the second last element here, which is, you know, like from, from, from the back, from the end, which is, you know, Mitch here, okay? Great, all right. The next uh, example that I'm going to be covering is what we call it slicing. So now we covered how we do just define list, define nested list, perform indexing, which is access element within the list. We know how to perform as well indexing in nested list, which is great. Now I know how to do negative indexing, which is how can we access element at the end of the list. And now I can actually define as well, we will call it element or list slicing which is just going into a list and actually obtaining just not one element, obtaining more than one element. All right, let's take a, let's take a look. I'm going to say, okay, let's define my list, and let's call it, for instance, 2. Let's call it Mitch, for example. Let's define, let's say, 5, 7, 8, and 10, and let's say 15, for example. All right, let's so run that. All right, that's my list, looks great. Let's assume, assume that I wanted to access, for example, a couple of elements in here. How can I access that? You know, just, not just one element. I actually want to go ahead and access more than one element. All right. We can do that by saying, okay, print. All right. I'm going to say my list, which is the name of the list that I wanted to access. Open square brackets. And then I can mention here the index, which is the start and end point of whatever values that I'm looking for. Okay. Let's assume I'm going to start, let's say, from zero. Okay, put two columns, and let's say put two. Let's see what's going to happen, okay? If I run that, you will find that you came up with a value of two and Mitch, okay? Which means that here, when I put zero, colon two, that means I'm asking to get the element with index of zero, which is this one, and then the element of index of one, which is this one, and that's it, we're going to stop. Which means that here, when I mention 0, dot, colon 2, that means I need the element of index of 0 and element of index of 1. And that's it. All right? And that's pretty, again, a little bit of conf confusing. Actually, there are two confusing points, you know, when it comes of, you know, like Python in general uh, indexing or slicing. First, the first element has a value of 0, or had index of 0, okay, not 1, all right? Second element, when I put 2, just think of it as it's not two, it's actually one. Okay, so we just, we put up to not this value and not including. That's the overall idea. Again, it's a little bit confusing, but think of it, read this as zero and one. So we need the element here, the first element and the second element, that's it. If I change that and I make it, let's say four, if I run it, you will come up with the elements of index zero, one, two, and three. You didn't include the index four, okay? All right. That's pretty, much, um, that's pretty much it. How can you access different elements? Let's say I wanted to access, for example, these elements, 8, 10, and 15. This is index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So here, I'm just going to come here and list 4, right? And then I need 5, 6, and 7, all right? So I'm going to just put 7 here. And if I run it, you'll come up with the values of 8, 10, and 15. You simply put, you took the elements, this is again 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You took the element number 4. 5, 6, and you didn't include 7, okay? Why? Because it's, again, you don't, you include up to and not including the last element, 7, all right? I hope it's pretty uh, clear and not confusing. Let's keep going. Let's assume that I wanted to print, for example, all the elements within the list. You can do that by using print, open parentheses, say my list, and what we could do, we're going to say open square brackets and just put two columns in there. Two columns here means all. Just bring them all, bring all the elements. If I run it, that will bring me all the elements that I have here within my list. All right, great. What if I wanted to, for example, obtain, let's say, the elements starting from, for example, this element, 
and moving on just you know all the list I need five seven eight ten and fifteen and all like all elements I can do that by saying okay print all right I'm gonna specify my list my list open square brackets and I could say I need the element this is element zero one two right let's assume that I'll say okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna do let's say elements starting from three and then say column when I say column that mean I need the element starting from number three and moving on all of it all the entire list if I run it then you will come up with the elements 7 8 10 and 15 again use this is index 0 1 2 and 3 so you started from the element number 3 and moving on and that's why we obtained all these elements here 7 8 10 and 15 all right the last one that I wanted to discuss is how can we obtain the length of the list which is how many elements are contained within the list you can do that by saying okay print my list open and you're gonna say I want it for example here if I wanted to obtain elements within the list if I wanted to get the length of the list I actually don't need to do this I'm just gonna remove this I'm gonna say okay I need the length which is a function to obtain the length of my list all right and I can actually print it on the screen I'm sorry here I just I need to add another bracket so if I run that that will give me number seven which is the number of elements that are contained within the list which is one two three four five six and seven seven elements and that's the number of elements by using the, the user function length. All right. And that's pretty much all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to cover um, two main uh, concepts or important concepts in Python programming, and they are dictionaries and Booleans. All right. So first, regarding the dictionaries, what, first, what do you mean by dictionaries? So dictionaries are mainly used to define kind of um, what we call it key value pairs so simply put we define um, instead of defining just a single integer for an instance or defining a, sin a single float for example or let's say a list as we covered before here we're going to have kind of you know a more advanced form or advanced data type that we call a dictionary okay think of a dictionary as a translator okay you list a list of keys associated with values and that's what we call it key value pair all right so you can have a key that has a certain value and then another key that can give you another value and then another key three that give you another value all right and that's pretty much how can you actually define a dictionary so if you wanted to access a specific value okay within the dictionary you don't access it with an index as we have done before when we described lists actually we're going to access this value using its key okay again think of it as kind of a door you are opening that door you know like you're accessing that value using that specific key associated with that value okay what's the importance of it again we're going to have tons of examples i'm going to show you what they mean by dictionaries and what do we even need it for all right so let's go ahead and define our first dictionary okay let's get started so first let's assume that i wanted to define a dictionary i'm going to say okay my dictionary for example equals to we define dictionary using curly brackets so we do this to just define a dictionary and then you associate simply key value pairs okay so you do this colon and you do this all right so basically here you define the key here you define the value associated to that key simply put so you say okay a key one and here we're going to say okay value one all right that would be the first key value pair we do comma press enter all right and we can do the same thing again all right we're gonna get again here define key two okay we can actually do this just to make it a little bit you know like um, more pretty and then we do value two all right sounds great comma and then we define the last element which is again key three associated to value three all right all right and that's pretty much how can you define your first dictionary so now we define a dictionary that has the key value pairs basically you can access that value using that specific key associated with that value that's pretty much it let's run it actually it looks good so if I wanted to view let's say my dictionary if I wanted to view it then we tell you okay there's actually key associated to value key associated to value and so on and so forth great what if I wanted to take a look at the type I'm gonna say okay type of dictionary type of my dictionary all right if I run that will tell me okay well the type the data type is actually dictionary which makes sense and we're expecting this 
Let's see how can we access elements within the dictionary. Let's assume that I wanted to access this value, okay? Uh, compared to lists, if you wanted to access specific elements within the list, you can access them using their index, right? Here, to access elements within a dictionary, you access them using their key. So let's see how can we access this specific element within our dictionary. You can, what you could do, you can say, okay, my dictionary, open square brackets, and then inside these square brackets, you say, okay, I need the value associated to key 2, all right? It's like open, for example, that specific door. Open that door using this basically key so you can return this value. If you run it, you will come up with value 2, which is associated to the corresponding key. All right. Let's take a look at some of, you know, more practical example. Let's assume that I wanted to define a dictionary that contains, you know, the information about Apple, iPhone X, which is, you know, was released, let's say, in 2018, for example. All right, let's do this. I'm going to say, okay, my dictionary, sorry, my dictionary equals to, we're going to open again curly brackets. What we could do, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to list here, for example, my brand is Apple. All right? This is the first one first element in the dictionary and the second element I'm going to say okay my model is iPhone X for example whatever you can call it okay and then I'm going to specify okay my year is simply 2018 all right what you could do you can do this okay looks great so now we define brand is Apple model is iPhone X and year is 2018 looks great if I run it, then you define a dictionary. If you wanted to print, let's say your dictionary, you can say, okay, print my underscore dictionary, run it. You'll come up with a brand, Apple, model, iPhone, year 2018, looks great. What if I wanted, for example, to access iPhone X? How can I access this? I can access this again using its key. I'm going to say, okay, go to my dictionary, open a square bracket, and access simply my model. If you do this, you say, okay, go to my dictionary, get whatever corresponding to my model, it will going to return my iPhone X. Okay, that's great. What if I wanted, for example, to access, let's say, um, the, um, uh, the second element, for example. Let's assume that I wanted to access uh, my, for example, year, which is 2018. I can say, okay, I can go to my dictionary and square bracket and access my year. If I do this, we're going to return 2018. Okay, perfect. What if I wanted to, let's say, add a new item to an existing dictionary? Okay, how can we do that? We can do that by, again, assigning, okay, going to the My Dictionary. I want to add item or add line to My Dictionary, okay, which is the exact same dictionary that I have here. I'm going to call it by name, My Dictionary, and add, let's assume, I'm going to add, for example, color, okay, and that color will have an associated value. We're going to say, okay, equals to, and then here you specify, let's say, the value which is red. Basically, what you have done here is you're adding existing element to your existing dictionary. All right, if I run that, nothing happened, okay, everything looks good. And I can again here say, okay, print my underscore dictionary, I run that, you will find that the color red has been added to your dictionary, which is great. All right. What if I wanted, for example, to delete a specific element within our dictionary? What you could do, you're going to say, okay, use delete, and then you can specify, for example, I wanted to, let's say, delete my brand, Apple X, uh, um, Apple. To do that, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to do delete, for stand for del which stands for delete what's my name of my dictionary my dict open square brackets and I wanted to delete the entire brand for example if I run that and if I come here and say okay print my dictionary if I run it you'll find that the brand has been gone just model year and color is the only values that have been appearing here what if I wanted to delete for example the entire dictionary let's say how can we do this we can delete it by saying, okay, del my underscore dictionary. That will delete the entire thing, not just here as we deleted just one key value pair. Here we're just going to delete the entire thing. Let's delete it. Actually, it's gone already. Let's assume that I want it, for example, you know, to assume that I don't know. I'm going to say, okay, let's say print. I'm going to print my dictionary. If I run it, then okay, well, I don't know what that is because, you know, name my dictionary is not defined because you just deleted the entire thing. Okay? All right. That's pretty much all what I have for dictionary. So let's recover. Um, uh, let's um, just give you again um, a review what we have done so far here we know how can we define a dictionary as a kind of a key value pairs now we know how can we obtain the type of a dictionary how can we let's say access specific element within the dictionary using its key so by the key I can obtain the value which is great 
Now I know how can I add element within a dictionary. How can I delete specific item or key value pair within the dictionary? And how can I delete the entire thing? All right. And that's pretty much kind of a quick summary of dictionaries. Again, I'm going to use them extensively within the practical aspect of the project. All right. Okay. The next topic that I wanted to discuss is what we call it Booleans. All right. So Booleans are values that can be represented as one of two constant objects, either false or true. Booleans behave like an integers of zero or one. All right. What do you mean by that? So in, in general, when we, um, in computer systems in general, all, everything you see, all the screen that you see, all the colors you see, all the, you know, the numbers you are doing, everything is just represented as a bunch of zeros and one. Where zero indicates false, one indicates true. That's pretty much it, okay? And by putting all these zeros and one next to each other, then you come up with kind of, you know, a meaning to it, okay? So you can, you can basically portray or send a message using these bunch of zeros and ones. And that's what we call it Booleans, okay? So when we define, for example, specific, let's say, number 9 or 8 or whatever, these are what we call it decimal numbers. In Booleans, okay, the base is 2, which means we only have two combinations, either 0 or 1. That's it. That's all what we could do. All right? So in Python, what we could do, we can say, okay, if I say true, okay, you see that has been listed as green, okay, which means that this is basically reserved as kind of, you know, saying 1. That means... There's a condition that has been satisfied, and there's a flag that we call it it's one, which means right, which means it's true, which means one, if we think about it. False is basically false. Okay, if we run it, that's basically false, all right? Okay, so what's the advantage of doing this? Actually, we can use the true and false in what we call it the conditional statements. We're going to cover tons of conditional statements in the future. We're going to learn how to do if conditions and how to do like conditional statements and so on. Here, this is just a quick example. Let's assume that I have, for instance, x equals 10, for instance, and I define another variable, y equals 10. And what I could do is I wanted to say, okay, please, can you check if x, okay, and that's, you know, you might like a little bit, get a little bit surprised, but I'm going to do something strange here. I'm going to say, is x equals equals y, all right? That's it. So what I have done here is basically this is what we call it assignment, which means I put value of 10 inside x. I put value of 10 inside y. This, let's copy it here in a separate one. This is what we call it comparison. We are comparing, simply. we are checking. Okay, we are saying, okay, could you please check if x equals to y? We do this by doing equal equal. Okay, it looks strange, but that's how it is. That's in most programming languages. So we define x equals y. Here I'm saying, okay, could you please, you know, asking kind of, you know, Python to check, okay, can you tell me if x equals y or not? If I run it, you tell me, well, that's actually true. Why? Because it is true. x was 10 and y was 10. All right? Okay? What if I say, change this and make it, let's say, 2? If I run it, and here if I'm asking, could you please tell me if x equals equals y? If I run it, they'll tell me, well, no, that's false. That's kind of a flag that we call it 0. Okay? And then you can put whatever that answer in, in somewhere else or print it on the screen, for example, like this, print, for instance, and that we're going to print it on the screen. And then we're going to tell me, okay, well, it's false. Okay? All right. Obviously, there are tons of stuff that we could do here. There are not equal, there are greater than or equal. You can do whatever, you, again, we're going to have an entire lecture, just cover that. But just, you know, a quick overview, let's say I wanted to print, okay, if x, for example, is greater than y, okay? If I run that, if I run that, and then, well, that's true. Why? Because x was 10 and y was actually 2. So conditional statement, you're, con you're comparing the two. And since the answer is true, it's going to apply back with a Boolean value of true, which is, you know, kind of while we are discussing the Booleans to start with. Again, to summarize, Booleans means 0 or 1s or true or false. We're going to use them extensively throughout the practical aspect of the course. And that's pretty much all what I have for this lecture. Again, you're getting closer to Mastering Python. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the exercises section. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So in this section, we're going to cover what we call it tuples and sets. So we're going to learn what do you mean by tuple and what do you mean by set. And we'll see how can we define tuples and define sets and uh, what's the difference mainly between tuples and sets and all other, you know, data types that we covered previously in the past. So let's get started with tuples first. So a tuple 
is a sequence of what we call it immutable Python objects. Okay, it looks intimidating, but you know, it's very, very simple. Simply put, once you define a tuple, you simply can change it again, moving forward. It's kind of, you know, like, a, like you know, like you, you, you store a variable and that variable doesn't change. You are not allowed to even write it again. Okay, it's like, it's like your password, you know, you just, you set it once and you are not allowed to change it, for example, you know, like ever again. Okay, let's assume that you can change it moving forward. All right, that's pretty much what tuples is. You know, the 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 definition of tuples, you know, is pretty much very similar to the definition of lists. The, the way of accessing or indexing elements in tuples is very similar to lists as well. And you're going to see that there's tons of similarities between the two. The only difference is tuples simply you can't just go and override a tuple. That's it. That's all what I want you to know. All right, let's get started. So how can we define a tuple? Let's get an idea first. So we're going to say, okay, I'm going to define tuple underscore one, which is whatever, you can call it my tuple or whatever. When we define a list, we use square brackets like this, right? When we define a tuple, we actually use parentheses like this. Then you can list whatever you want. You're going to say, okay, Mitch, for example, the first element. Sandy, for example, the second element. 10, 15, whatever, 1992, whatever you want, and that we're going to be my tuple. That's it. That's how you call a tuple. Let's make sure that actually we are on the right page. You're going to say, okay, type my tuple underscore one. But on that, then you will find that the type is tuple, which is a new data type that we, we just introduced right now. How can I access elements within the tuple? Actually, it's even, even easier. So I'm going to say, okay, I want to go into tuple, uh, tuple underscore one. It's my tuple, and I wanted to access, for example, let's say the first element here, Mitch. It's exactly the same as we have done before when it comes to list. Open square bracket and let's say zero. That will return Mitch and make it one. That will return Sandy. Make it two, and that should return number 10. All right, again, zero, one, two, three, and four. Exactly the same as list as we have covered before. All right, so that's how we do indexing. How can we do slicing to capture, for example, specific elements? Again, even easier. Tuple underscore one, open square brackets, and then you say I want it, for example, one, two, three. If you run it, again, that's index zero, that's index one, which you're gonna take Sandy. This is number two, right? So again, I'm gonna take 10, and I didn't take 15 because when I mentioned three, I take up to, but excluding number three. Exactly the same as we have done before, in the past all right now to the fun part all that looks very similar okay the only difference basically as we have done before right now is this so instead of square bracket we just make it you know parenthesis that's it that's all what it is okay all right so what's the difference let's see what's the difference so if we say for example tuple underscore one and i want to go let's say to element number one and i want it assigned let's say number 30 to it all right okay if i do this well you know, that's the problem here you can say okay no no you're not allowed to do that Tuple object does not support item assignment, okay? Which makes sense because that contradicts with the definition of the tuple, which is a sequence of immutable Python objects, which is, you know, stuff that you can't change. Here you are asking to change this element and put 30 in it, which is you are not allowed, all right? Okay, this is basically the main difference. Okay, the last one is if you wanted to create a new tuple from existed tuple, you can actually do that too. So let's assume that I wanted, for example, to create um, a tuple, another tuple, for example. So I'm going to say, okay, I need to, let's say, the same tuple that we have before, tuple one. I'm going to copy it here again. And I want to create, let's say, tuple underscore two. And let's say I'm going to define it as four, let's say five, nine, and let's say two. Okay, that's another tuple. All right. And what I wanted to do here is I wanted to, let's say, create a new tuple. I can actually do this. From the pre to do the, these two tuples, I can create a tuple called, called tuple3 that's equal to tuple underscore 1 plus tuple underscore 2. Well, that's allowed. If I run that, well, you see there's no error here, which is good. And if I wanted to, let's say, print my tuple underscore 3, I can do that. Then you can find Mitch, Sandy, 10, 15, 19, 92, 4, 5, 9, 2, which is simply you concatenated tuple 1 and tuple 2 together. All right, perfect. The next topic that we wanted to discuss here is what we call it sets. A set is an unordered collection of items. Simply put, 
there are no no duplicates and they have no order okay what do you mean let's take a look so let's assume we're going to define my set how can we define a set we define a set using curly brackets let's say okay one two and three then you have defined the set and if i wanted to let's say print for example my set i'm going to say okay print my set if i run it you'll find that this is my set looks great and if I wanted, for example, to, let's say, um, get the data type, I'm going to say, okay, I need my data type of my, um, of my set. If I run that, then you will find the data type is actually set. Okay, that's great. All right, so what do you mean by having no duplicates? Okay, which is basically each element has to be unique. Let's take a look. Let's assume we're going to define, again, my underscore set, and I'm going to create, let's say, a couple of elements, one, two, three, four, and then three and two. If I run that, and if I, let's say, I'm gonna print my underscore set, run it, you'll come up with one, two, three, four, which is weird. You know, if you take a look, you find that these two elements have been ignored, which makes sense because now, because these elements are duplicated, because here we have two and three, here we have two and three again, basically what we have done here is set, we, it doesn't allow duplicates, there are no duplicates. Each element has to be unique, all right? And the order doesn't really matter. All right, so that's pretty much how can you know like define a set and how if you if you, so if you define a set and if you have different elements that are duplicated, you know if you print if you go again and print your set you will find that the elements that are duplicated they are basically basically eliminated. Eight, any duplicate element is eliminated. Only just one representative sample is kept. All right, so how can we convert for example from a list to a set? So let's define a list, my list, and to find a list we'll use a square bracket. I'm going to define one, two, three, and two, okay? This is my list, so if I actually run this, you will find that if I wanted to print, for example, my underscore list, if I run it, you'll find that my list has one, two, three, and two, okay? If I wanted to convert from a list to a set, I can do this. I'm going to say, okay, my set would be equals to, I need to create a set out of my list. So I'm going to go to my list, all right, create a set out of it and put it in my set. All right, so let's run that. And if I wanted to, let's say, print my set, if I run it, you will find that basically the element has been, dupl any duplicate element has been el eliminated. So this two has been eliminated. We only kept one, two, or three, which is simply how can we convert from a list to a set. And that's it. That's all what I want you guys to know when it comes to tuples and sets. And that's pretty much all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you guys in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this course. In the previous section, we learned how to define uh, basic um, variables, how to perform some mathematical operations, how to do some precedence, which is, you know, kind of a very important foundation if you're going to start learning programming. In this section, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into more uh, kind of intermediate concepts, per se. So we're going to cover what we call it the comparison uh, operations. So we're going to cover the comparison operators. We're going to cover what we call it logical operators. And we're going to cover conditional statements, which is what we call it if-else statements. All right? Okay, I'm super excited because this section will gonna be uh, kind of the first step to actually start building kind of professional uh, real world uh, codes in Python. So let's go ahead and define the, what do you mean by comparison operators, okay? So when we perform any programming in general, what we need to do is that we wanted to compare two values with each other, okay? So in order to compare two values, all right, let's say I have two values, for example, or two, two parameters, let's say A and B, for instance, and I wanted to compare these two parameters together. How can I do that comparison? Let's see. So let's assume that I wanted, for example, to compare number 15 compared to, let's say, number 8. So here I have number 15, and I wanted to compare it to number 8. And I wanted to say, for example, if 15 is greater than 8. So in order to write greater, or less than, we use basically these kind of um, operators to do this. So let's go ahead and run this cell and let's see what's gonna happen. So if we run this cell, you're gonna get a feedback or you know Python gonna reply back telling you actually that was true. Yes, why? Because you are asking kind of you know Python, okay, is 15 greater than eight? Okay, so the answer is true, that's right. That means you actually have done 
comparison between the um, value 15 and between the number 8. All right, okay. Let's take a look at another example. Let's assume that I wanted to compare, for example, 5 equals greater than, for example, or equals to 5. Just very simple, um, again, example. If we run that, that would tell me, yes, that's actually true. Why? Because I said, I asked Python again, is 5 greater than or equal 5? Yes, actually, 5 was equals to 5. So, again, Python replied back and tell you, well, that was true. Okay? And you can actually check pretty much all the operations in here. So the first operation that's, you know, kind of the most important one we're going to be using extensively in the practical part of the course is what we call it equal equal, okay? So simply you're comparing two values, okay? And you are saying if A equals to equals B or if A equals B, all right? If it's true, if that's true, then Python is going to reply back to you, tell you yes, that was true. If not, it will reply back, tell you it was false. Let's take a look. So let's say I'm asking, is 5 equals equals to 5? And let's run it. Shift enter. That will tell me, what, well, that was true, right? So I'm asking, is 5 equals equals, let's say, 6? If I run it, that will tell me, no, that was false. That wasn't right, okay? So the, the, the key important element here is why we don't just use one equal? Why didn't it say, for example, 5 equals to 6? If I do this, that will tell me, no, that, well, that's not right because one equal sign is what we call it assignment. That means you're assigning value. You are copying value from the right-hand side into the left-hand side. So if I say, let's say, x equals to six, yes, that would work. That means I'm putting six into the parameter x. If I take a look at x, you'll find that x contains six, which makes sense, right? All right, okay. So in order to perform conditional, kind of perform a conditional comparison, we use equal equal. If you wanted to do an assignment, which is, you know, putting value in a specific variable, we use just one single equal. All right. So what we could do as well is that we can actually perform comparisons on strings as well. So let's take a look. Let's assume that I wanted, for example, to compare hello, okay, is hello equals equals to hello. All right, let's run that. Now tell me, well, that was true. Okay, let's do it again. Let's say, okay, is hello equals equals to hello, okay? So please notice the difference here. So the difference here was one of them was total, all of them were uppercase. And here, the first letter only was uppercase and all of them were lowercase. If we run that, you will find that the answer is false, which means when we try to perform any comparisons, um, on strings, we have to make sure that all the letters are actually the same. If all of them are uppercase, then all of them here has to uppercase in order to get a true answer, okay? All right, one more operator, uh, which is what we call it not equal, okay? So for example, if you're comparing, let's say the value of six and your value of five, and you wanted to compare five and six, what we do is that we use the, simply the exclamation mark equal. The exclamation mark equals means not equal. So here if I'm saying, for example, is six not equal five? Well, that was true, that's right. Why? Because six was actually not equal five. So again, if we press shift enter, that will return back true. If I say, let's say, is five, let's say not equal five, and if I run that, that would tell me, well, that was false. Why? Because five is actually equal to five. It's, you know, when I ask if it's five not equal five, what well, actually this statement was false. All right, okay, sounds great. So let's go back here to the table. So again, equal, equal, that means if you're comparing two values, you know, like are they equal to each other or not? Exclamation mark equals, that means they are not equal, okay? Here, if you wanted to do greater than or less than, here you wanted to do if they are greater than, all right? that's less than, that's greater than or equal, and that's less than or equal. And that's very important comparison operators. We're gonna use them extensively throughout the course. And they're actually really, really interesting and really powerful too. All right, let's take a look at, you know, kind of a mini challenge. I'm gonna give you two examples and I'm gonna ask you to pause the video and please go ahead and try to do that challenge yourself without running the code, please. Because if you run the code, you know, it doesn't make sense. I want you to kind of practice and tell me if you, if you get the idea or not. 
Here I'm saying, okay, is 15 greater than, let's say, 6? And is 15 not equals to 6? And if 15 is equals equals 6? And if 15 is less than or equals to 6? All right? Please go ahead and pause the video and just, you know, guess what the answer should be on all of these four conditions. All right? We're going to see you after the challenge. All right, I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge again without running the code. So here, 15, is 15 greater than 6? Well, that was true. So the answer I'm expecting was actually true. Is 15 not equals to 6? Well, that was actually true as well, right? So here, 15 was not equal to 6. That was true. Is 15 equals to 6? Well, that was false. That doesn't make sense. Is 15 less than or equal 6? That was false as well. All right, let's make sure that our answers are true. So we're going to go here to the cell, press Shift Enter, Shift Enter, Shift Enter, Shift Enter, and that's what we're getting. We're getting true, true, false, false. All right, looks great. Okay, and that's pretty much all what I have for the, for the first section. Let's go ahead and recap what we have done so far. So here we have just quickly covered what we call the comparison operators which is can be used to compare two variables together. If you're comparing, you know, va values, you wanted to compare if they are equal, and please remember they are equal, equal, not equal, greater than or less than, greater than, less than, greater than or equal, or less than or equal. And again, the answer might be true or false, depending on the condition. And one important thing as well regarding the strings, you need to make sure when you're comparing two strings together, is that all the letters have to match. So if they are, all of them are lowercase, here all of them have to be lowercase. If here all of them are lowercase, here one of them, for example, is just uppercase, then the answer is going to be false right away. All right. I hope you guys enjoy that lecture and see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. In the previous lecture, we covered the comparison operators, and we, um, we watched how can we actually compare two parameters together using the either equal, equal, not equal, greater than or equal, and so on and so forth. In this section, we're going to cover what we call it logical operators, okay? Which is simply, if you wanted to compare two parameters in a logical format, from a logical perspective. All right, let's take a look at what do you mean by logical. Let's assume that we wanted, for example, to say, um, uh, or to perform an ending between two variables. Okay, what do you mean by an end or what do you mean by an or? Let's assume that we wanted, for example, to say, okay, is true and false, for instance. Okay, so again, true means one, false means zero. Okay, so when I say logical operators, that means the here, the and or or, okay, that's pretty much all what I'm, what, uh, like what I, what I meant by logical operator operators, and and or mainly. Okay, so when I say and, all right, that means I'm saying, okay, if this condition has to be true and this condition has to be true in order for the entire result to be true. All right, what do you mean by this? So let's take a look. So when I say true, please remember that true means one. Okay, that's the overall idea. True, that means one. False means zero. So here I'm saying, okay, is one and zero. What's the answer when I do one and zero? Think of the ending operation as simply um, um, as, as multiplication. Think of it this way. It's not clearly multiplication, but think of it as multiplication. So when you multiply 1 by 0, the answer will be equals to 0, all right, which is false. Let's run that, and that's actually what we've got here. So when I say if I wanted to perform true and false, the answer is going to be false. All right. So, okay, again, from a logical perspective, when I say and, that means both conditions have to be true in order for the outcome to be true. So here I'm saying, okay, this has to be true and this has to be true in order to generate um, a true output. All right, let's take a look at another example. Let's assume true and true, which is one, one and one. Let's compare that. So the answer here, what, what, what answer do we expect? If we run that, that will generate true, that will generate one, which makes sense. Here I'm saying this condition is true and as well this condition was true. So 
the ending, both of them will generate a true value. All right. Let's take a look at another example. Let's assume we're going to ending false and true, which is simply I'm saying, okay, I want it to false again means zero. Ending the true means one. So the answer here we're going to be zero. Let's run that. And that will generate a false. Why? Because in order for the AND gate, okay, in order for the AND logical operator to generate one, both conditions have to be true. So this has to be true, and this has to be true as well in order to generate true output. All right, what about false and false? So if I say false and false, okay, please make sure it's uppercase. That should, that means zero, ending zero, and the output should be obviously zero. So if we'd say zero, false and false, that would generate output is false. All right, and that's pretty much what do you mean by the end operation or the end gate. Let's take a look at the OR gate or the end op or the OR operation. So when it comes to OR, okay, if any of the two conditions is true, that's it, done, we're good. Here I'm saying, okay, if the first condition is true or the first or the second condition is true, the output will gonna be true as well, okay? So OR is actually better than, you know, the end, which is, you know, the OR simply will only gonna generate zero or only we're gonna generate false if both inputs are actually false or both inputs are actually zeros. All right, let's take a look. So I'm gonna say, okay, let's, just, let's say true or true. That should generate true. So here I'm saying one or one. So the output should be one. Let's run that. That would tell me, okay, true or true is actually true. So true or false, all right, which is simply again here, that means I'm saying one or zero. Let's run that. That will generate true. Why? Because when we use or, if any of the inputs is true, then the output will gonna be true as well. All right. If I say, for example, okay, false or true, okay, then here I'm saying, okay, zero, or one, right? Which is false again means zero, two means one. If I run that, that would generate true as well. So please bear in mind that for when it comes to OR operation, if any of the inputs is true, again here one of them was true, one of them was true, one of them was true, the output will gonna be true all along the way. The only case the OR will generate gonna generate false, well, if both inputs are false. So we're gonna say, okay, false or false, which sim simply means zero or zero, that will generate simply zero. Please bear in mind that here one or zero, that will generate one, and zero or one, that, sh that should generate one. Let's run that, and that's what we got here. We got false, which makes complete sense. All right, perfect. Okay, so that's pretty much um, all, what we're, all what I wanted to cover when it comes to AND and OR. Let's take a look at kind of more practical example into an actual combining kind of the logical operators along with the comparison operators in just one statement. Let's assume that I wanted to evaluate this condition. I wanted to say is six greater than two, okay? And is two equals five, right? So please, without running, for example, this, this cell, please tell me what, what do you expect? So simply here, I'm saying, okay, is six greater than two, well, what do you expect here on that condition? Well, that the first element was actually true. So that means the first one was true. And I'm saying and, right? I'm saying is two, here I'm asking, is two equals five? Well, the answer is false, right? So when I perform true and false, if you guys remember, if I do true here and true and false, the answer will be false. Because again, when you do and, that means I'm asking, this condition has to be true and this condition has to be true in order for the output to become true. So that means here I'm expecting the answer to be false. Let's run that and that's what we got. We got false. All right. So here I'm going to write, leave you guys for just a quick challenge. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to evaluate these two conditions. So I'm going to ask is six greater than two or is two equals to five? And you're gonna have another challenge as well. I'm gonna say is two equals to three, and is four equals to three, and 
I'm going to say is 10 equals to 10. All right. Uh, so uh, please go ahead, guys, and, and pause the video. And just without running these cells, let me know what do you expect. Do you expect here the answer will going to be false or true? And here the answer is going to be false or true. All right. Please go ahead, and I'll see you guys after the challenge. All right. I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge. So here I'm saying, okay, is 6 greater than 2? Well, th this answer, well, that's true. And I'm saying, or, is 2 equals to 5 or not? So, well, 2 is actually not equal to 5. So that means here I'm saying is 2 equals to 5. Well, that was false, right? If I say true or false, since we have or here, then the outcome should be true. Because again, when it comes to or, if any of the input is true, the outcome will be true. All right, let's run that. Well, that's pretty good. Let's do the other next challenge. Here I'm saying it's 2 equals to 3. Well, that was false. And I'm going to say, okay, is 4 equals to 3. Well, that was false as well. And is 10 equals to 10. Well, that was true. All right, so when it comes to AND, if any of the inputs to the AND gate is false or is zero, the outcome will going to be zero. So here I'm expecting to be false. All right, let's run that. And that's what we've got. We got false. All right, and that's pretty much all what I have for this section. Let's recap what we have done. So in, the, in this section, we covered the logical operators. So now we know how can we perform ANDing operation, how can we perform OR operation. And here, how can we mix them, make them somehow into some of the comparison operators that we have done in the past, in the previous section, to come up with kind of more logic, or kind of, you know, like a, an advanced logic in a way. All right? Okay, in the next section, we're going to cover the conditional statements, which is very exciting. I'm super excited, because now we're actually going to combine all what we have learned so far to perform what we call it if-else condition, which is kind of the foundation when it comes to programming in general. I hope you guys enjoyed that lecture and see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. I'm super excited because in this lecture we're going to discuss the conditional statements, which is what we call it if-else statements. They are really, really powerful and they are kind of the foundation or the kind of the, the basic building block of any programming language. All right. So let's recap what we have done before. In the previous section, we covered um, the uh, logical operators, and we covered as well what we call it the um, comparison operators. And in this section, we're going to cover the conditional statements, which we'll call it if-else statements. Let's assume that we wanted to uh, divide our code, okay, kind of into two sections, or we'll call it two different path lines, all right? Let's assume that I wanted to, for example, compare the value of, let's say, 5, number 5, and number 2. So I'm going to do that comparison like this. I'm going to say, okay, if, and that's how we write the if condition. I'm asking if 5 is greater than 2, okay? And then in order to write the if condition, we put colon in here, and then we press enter. And you will see that simply here that has been in indented. That means, you know, like there is kind of a space in here. And here we actually write the body of the if condition. Okay. And that's the beauty of Python. You don't need to put like, you know, like brackets or curly brackets or, you know, like C or any other programming language, which is really tough to like, I don't say tough, but it's, it's way more complex than Python. Python is very intuitive, very easy. So let's assume that I wanted to compare if five is greater than two, I want to go ahead and do something. And then I say, okay, else, if that condition is not true, let's do something different. Okay. So I'm here I'm asking, if 5 is greater than 2, I'm going to say, okay, print. And I'm going to say print true. All right. Okay. So I wanted to print on the screen true if this condition is true. All right. Okay. Looks great. And what I'm going to do here, I have to go back. Please make sure that when you write the if-else if, statement, that the if and the else have to be aligned here. And the body of the if has to be shifted a little bit. So here I'm going to write, okay, else, and please don't forget the colon, press enter, and you will find that simply the body of the if and the body of the else will going to be aligned here. I'm going to say, okay, print, and I'm going to print false. 
All right, that's it. So simply put, what we have done here is really powerful. Okay, it looks pretty easy, but it's actually very, very powerful. Why it's powerful? It's really powerful because now I actually created kind of, you know, like two paths within my code. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna split my code into two sections. This section, which is the body of the if, and this section, which is body of the else. Which means that if, for example, here, if I compare five compared to two, I'm gonna say, okay, is five greater than two? Well, that condition is gonna turn true, right? So if the if condition is true, then we're going to execute this command, and that's it. And that's the beauty of it. We're not going to execute this. We're not gonna to go to the else, ever. We're just gonna execute the body of the if condition if the if condition is true, all right? What if this condition is false? If this condition is false, we're actually gonna skip this and only perform the body of the else or execute the body of the else, which is the beauty of, you know, if, if else condition. All right, let's run that. And you will find that, you know, simply here, it has, we printed true on the screen. Okay, so why is that? You know, like what happened? So simply put, because five is greater than two, which is this condition was true, we actually implemented this and that's it. We didn't basically implement the else portion of it. All right, let's take a look at, again, pretty much the exact same example. I'm just gonna copy it here. And let's print, for example, something different. Let's say, okay, if condition is true, I'm gonna say here, for example, if condition is false, all right? Okay, let's run that, and that makes sense. So basically here, we said, okay, if group five is greater than two, let's go ahead and basically execute the body of the if, and that's what we have got here. If not, let's go and execute the else condition, all right? So, okay, sounds great. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna leave you guys for a quick challenge. Here, I'm gonna compare um, actually, let's gonna compare this, and I'm asking you guys without running the code. Please let me know which one will gonna be executed. If this one gonna be executed or this one will gonna be executed. Please go ahead and pause the video and see you guys after the challenge. All right. I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge yourself. Here, simply, I'm asking: Is five equals to ten or not? Okay. Well, five is actually not equal to 10, which means that I cannot or I will not gonna execute the body of the if. I'm gonna go back to the else here. I'm gonna execute the else part, which is, well, if condition is actually false, all right? Let's run that, and that's all I've got here, which makes sense. Why? Because the if condition or this condition actually failed or we know was, wasn't true, so we went there and we executed the else body only. And that's why we executed if condition is false. All right. Let's take a look at kind of a little bit more advanced concept when it comes to if else conditions, which is what we call it else if, okay? Let's assume that I wanted, for example, to compare, let's say, or have three different paths within my code. So instead of having two different paths, I wanted to have three different paths. Let's do this. I'm gonna say, okay, if, five is equals to seven, okay, colon. I wanted to go ahead and print, let's say first statement is true, okay? And here, and that's the beauty of it, since I wanted to create kind of three different paths, I cannot just go and write else. I actually wanted to in import or in in insert another il else if condition. So I'm gonna say, okay, to write this, I'm gonna call it else if. And we actually combine it in just L if. And you guys can see that here it's turned to green, okay, which is kind of reserved keyword for Python. I'm gonna say, okay, L if two equals equals to four, for instance, just any numbers. I'm gonna press enter. And here we're gonna say, okay, print second, statement is true, okay? And the else, which is if none of these conditions were true, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and print, let's say the last statement, statement is true. 
All right. Okay, so what do you guys expect? Let's, okay, without running the code, here I'm asking, is five equals to seven? Well, that was false, so I'm gonna skip this, right? I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna have another if condition. Here I'm asking, is two equals to four? Well, that wasn't true. So I'm gonna go ahead here and ex execute this, which is the last statement is true. Let's run that, and that's actually what we've got here. Last statement is true, okay? All right. Let's go ahead and leave you guys as well for a quick challenge. Okay, I'm gonna say, okay, let's copy that, let's paste it. And here we're gonna compare is less than, here we're gonna say greater than, and that's it, okay? Please go ahead guys and pause the video and please do not run the cell, just tell me what, which one do you expect we're gonna be executed. Please go ahead and see you guys after the challenge. All right, I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge yourself. So here I'm asking if five less than seven, well, that condition was actually true, right? So here I'll simply gonna execute the first one. So let's run it. And the first one we're gonna be executed. So first statement is actually true. All right, makes complete sense. Let's take a look at one last example before we jump into the exercises section. So here I'm saying, okay, let's, um, for example, uh, insert, let's define, let's assume that we wanted to build kind of our password um, um, uh, password system. So we're gonna grant access to the user if they enter the password successfully. All right, so let's see how can we do that. We're gonna say, okay, we're gonna say, okay, name equals to, which is our variable, input, in order to feed data from the user, I'm gonna print to the screen, enter your username. Sorry, username, all right? So here simply I'm asking the user to enter their username and if the username was right or was correct without, give, without, without password or anything, just if the username was right, I was just gonna give them access. If it's wrong, then I'm not gonna give them access. That's pretty much it. And the username that I'm gonna use here is let's say, what, you can pick whatever name. Here I'll just select it for example, like my name for instance. I'm gonna say, okay, if here I'm comparing, Simply, and that's why we use the if condition, because we wanted to have, we have two options within our code. We have either to grant the user access or to deny him access. So we're gonna say, okay, if name equals equals to Ryan, okay, and please don't forget the column, I'm gonna say, okay, print, I'm gonna say access granted, all right? I'm gonna say here, else, which is if not, I'm gonna print access denied. All right, and that's it. That's pretty much it. Let's run that code, let's run it. So here, when I press shift enter, you'll find that here is asking you enter, you enter your username. So you have to enter your username. So I'm gonna say, okay, I will enter Ryan. And if I run it, you'll find, well, access granted. Why? Because this condition has been satisfied. I inserted value here, okay? And name has my name right now, has Ryan in there. And here I'm comparing is Ryan equals equals to Ryan. It will say yes, then we're gonna get access granted. If not, then access is gonna be denied. All right, let's run it one more time. I'm gonna say enter your username. So I'm gonna say R-Y-A-N, and please note that here I inserted all the values here were uppercase, right? If I run that, you will find access denied. It will tell me no, access denied, why? Because when you compare uppercase, all uppercase, with the, the only letter, only first letter is uppercase, actually the access will not gonna be granted. These two strings are not the same. And that's why you get access denied in this case. All right, so I'm gonna leave you guys for a quick challenge. It's a little bit, might be a little bit tough. Here, I wanted to basically make the system a little bit more robust, okay? I wanted to grant the user access if they enter their name like this, or if they inserted their name like this, which is R Y A N all uppercase, or if they inserted the name all lowercase, like R Y A N all lowercase. All right. So I'm gonna leave you guys for that quick challenge. Please go ahead, pause the video, and I'll see you guys after the challenge. All 
All right, I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge yourself. So what I ask you guys to do here, let's copy this and let's paste it here. And I ask you guys to make the code kind of a little bit more robust in a way. And in order to add here, instead of having just R as uppercase and Ryan afterwards, I wanted you guys to add more conditions. So I'm gonna say, okay, if name equals equals to Ryan or, right, name, was equals equals to all uppercase, right? Or name was equals equals to all lowercase. So you know I'm saying, okay, if all of them are uppercase, or all of them are lowercase, or the first letter only with uppercase, and that the system will kind of be, be a little bit more robust. So you know, like you can insert your username, whatever you feel like. Let's run that and let's make sure it actually works. So let's enter our username. Let's try our first one, which we've tried before. Will tell me, well, access granted. Let's run it one more time. I'm gonna say, okay, R-Y-A-N, all uppercase. Let's run it. Tell me, well, access granted to. If you guys remember, we, if we, when we did that before, it was access denied, okay? Let's run one more time. Here I'm saying, okay, R-Y-A-N, all of them are lowercase. Let's run it. Tell me, well, access granted to, okay? All right, let's run it. And for example, insert, let's say Ryan one, for instance, let's run it. Then well, access denied, which makes complete sense. All right, I hope you guys enjoy this lecture. Let's recap what we have done so far. In this section, we discussed how can we do conditional statements. So now we know how can we write if else condition and kind of create, you know, kind of uh, two paths within our code. Here we learned how can we do multiple if else conditions like this one, which is having three, for example, case, cases in this case. And we learned as well how to kind of develop a more kind of advanced form into doing um, or creating a password or username um, access system. If the user inserts their access or username correct, we're gonna give them access. If not, we're gonna deny them access. And we learned here how can we produce the or logical condition to actually um, apply more than one condition that might be true, we're gonna give the user access. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that lecture. In the next lecture, we're gonna start, go ahead and start, you know, like we have tons of exercises for you. Please stay tuned and see you guys in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this new section. In this section, we're going to cover um, a very important basics in programming in general, which is known as loops. Okay, so we're going to cover mainly two major or two important types of loops, and we call them for loops and while loops, all right? And afterwards, we're gonna have tons of exercises ready uh, for you, um, mainly dedicated to for loops and while loops. So let's get started. Let's see how can we actually create a loop first, and we'll see how can we uh, go through it in so many different exercises and practice through um, many examples. All right, so let's get started. First of all, why do we need loops? Or what's the point of having four loops? So the overall idea is that we, if let's assume that we wanted, for example, to let's say print, for example, hello, okay? Very simple, basic line of code. So let's say if we press shift enter, you will find that you found here, hello, right? All right, sounds good. What if you wanted to repeat this, let's say 10 times? All right, so maybe one solution, someone can say, okay, maybe we can copy this and paste it here and press shift enter and then copy and paste it several times, uh, shift enter and so on. This is obviously not an efficient way of performing or of doing this, right? So obviously there is an easier way to repeat. If you wanted to repeat certain command several times, then we can use what we call it loops, which is a way of just instead of repeating the exact same command several times within the code you just write it once and somehow you create a for loop in there to actually repeat it in a very kind of it's just two lines of code you can literally print like thousands of these hellos all right okay that's the overall idea of why do we need loops in general and why do we need for a loop for example in particular all right okay so let's go ahead and actually delete all this and let's get started and see how can we create our first loop all right Let's assume that I wanted to, that I, for example, I have a list and list, this list, I call it my list and I put there one, two, and three, okay? And if I press shift enter, and if I take a look at my list, you will find that there is here, that there is, these are the three numbers, which is one, two, three. 
Let's assume that I wanted, for instance, to print all these elements within my list. Like I wanted to print one first element within the list, second element within the list, and then third element within the list. How can I do that? All right. So what you could do, you can then create a for loop to do it. So let's see how can we do that. First of all, this is the syntax of a for loop. We're going to say for i in, and then you write here the name of the list that you have here, which is my list. And then you put colon at the end. And then once you press enter, you will find that here, uh, basically there's an in indent here. So you actually have, there's a space kind of in here. And that means that what, whatever we're going to be writing here indicates that's the body of my four. Okay. So that means whatever we're going to be writing here, we're going to be repeated several times depending on this. I'm going to, again, I haven't discussed what's happening here, but let's see how can we do that. So I'm going to say, okay, four I in my list. And what I'm going to do, all right, so what you could do afterwards, you can say, okay, I want it to print my variables i, okay? And if you press shift enter, here we go. Then you will find that there is numbers one, two, three, which is all the elements contained within my list here have been printed, all right? So what happened here? Let's see how can we read it, okay? So what happened in is here, as I'm saying, okay, for i, you can name it whatever you want, here I call it index i, in, and then you indicate, let's say, the name of the list that you have, which is my list one, two, three. And you simply what you're saying is you're saying, okay, please go ahead, grab each and individual elements within that list. So for instance, first one, we're going to grab the first element, which is one. So in the first run of the loop, I will have number equals to one. Okay. So I equals to one in the first loop. And then I'm going to go here. I'm going to say, okay, print that number, print one. And that's why we've got print one. And then what happened is we're actually going to go up again and then we're going to go here take the second element within my list and that's my second element which is two so i in this case will contain the second the value associated with the second element in my list which is two and then i'm going to go here and print two go up again take the third element and then go here and print it again and that's why you printed number three all right okay and that's pretty much how can you run any for loops which is very very easy and very intuitive so next step is, let's assume that I wanted, for example, to, let's say, print hello world three times. So I'm going to say, okay, for i in, and I'm going to say, let's say, my list, all right, which is simply what we have here. Okay, I know that there are three elements in here. Let's say, okay, for i in my list. I can simply do actually two, two things. I'm going to say, okay, print. I can print my variable i, which is exactly the same as before. And I can maybe do something as well. Maybe I'm going to go and print, let's say, hello world afterward, afterwards. Okay, so every time I'm gonna go print i, so we're gonna say, let's say print one, two, and three, and afterwards, after you print each of these numbers, you're going to print hello world. So press shift enter, and here we go. So now we come with number one, which is here, and then afterwards you print hello world. You go up again, this is like an iteration within the loop. I'm gonna print number two, and then I'm going to print hello world. Go up again, then print number three, and then print hello world, which is, Great. Okay. All right. So let's assume that I have, for example, a list of strings. Again, I'm just trying to expose you guys with like, you know, like show you different examples within the for loop. Okay. And how to create loops. So let's assume I have another list and my list is defined as this. My list equals to, let's say a couple of, let's say fruits. I'm going to define them as apple. I'm going to define them as, let's say blueberries. Blueberries. Okay. It's actually double R here. And uh, we are going to, let's say, specify mangoes, specify, let's say, watermelon. Actually, again, here, watermelon. And maybe grab one more fruit as well. Let's call it apricots, for instance. Press shift enter. Here we go. Let's take a look at my list. Copy and paste. Let's take a look at it. Then you'll come up here with apple, blueberries, mangoes, and watermelon. Let's assume that I wanted to, for example, let's say, print all the elements within my um, within my string in here, within my list, okay, which is simply a list of strings, okay, so what I could do, I'm going to say, okay, for i, or you can call it whatever, in my list, and then again, you press colon, press shift enter, you will find that here we have got the tab, you are going to say print the value of i, that's it, press shift enter, and here we go, first of all, you're going to go here, i in my list. So first, we're going to go ahead and grab the first element within the list, which is apple. And you're going to come here, you're going to say print apple. And then you go up again, you take the second element within my list, which is mango blueberries. 
you're gonna come here print blueberries or come again mangoes and so on and that's why you're printing all of it here okay all right sounds great so afterwards let's maybe take another example let's assume that i wanted for instance to loop to create a loop and that loop will gonna be created over a string all right so what do you mean so what we could do we're gonna say okay for i in let's say i have a string here it's called mangoes for example okay or just mangoes like this and what i could do i'm gonna say okay every time please go ahead and print i so what's gonna happen here i'm gonna say okay please go ahead for i in mangoes so every time you're gonna go here grab a letter within the string so first we're gonna grab the first letter which is gonna be m and that's why i printed m go up again you're gonna print get, get a and that's why i printed a and so on and that's what's happening here okay so simply put what we have done so far is that we're able to go ahead in there print if you wanted to print let's say numbers within the list i would be able to do that if i wanted let's say to print you know like hello world or whatever i can do it here too if i wanted to have a list as well but that list contains strings in there let's say apple blueberries whatever then i would be able to print it as well and i can also be able to go ahead create a for loop that goes through the letters each individual letters okay our characters and actually print them as well all right and that's kind of the power of for loops you can actually do it um, um, in a way that you, you can print whatever you can print you know like characters within the strings you can print strings within a list you can print print numbers within a list you can repeat on whatever you wanted to do all right okay so one more example example let's assume that i wanted for example to have let's say a list of numbers and i define these numbers as let's say one two three three four five and let's say six and what i wanted to do is i wanted to sum up all these numbers so i wanted to create a loop okay and this loop will simply gonna go ahead here and grab simply an, an, like a number all right and add it to kind of you know an accumulator we'll call it accumulator and then the next time we're going to go in the iteration take the second number add it as well take the third number add it as well and that's what we're going to be keep doing until i um, actually sum all the numbers in there so to do that okay first step i'm going to say okay sum equals to zero so when i say sum equals to zero i can actually let's call it let's say sum of numbers equals to zero and this is simply what we call an accumulator this is just a variable that carries or accumulates all the variables or all the summation let's say or let's say multiplication and so on and i initialize it to zero first and what i could do afterwards we're going to say okay for number in numbers all right and that's kind of a famous way of actually writing kind of a for loop here i have a list of numbers right what i could do i'm going to say okay i'm going to create a for loop and that for loop will go ahead here take a number within numbers think about it okay i'm going to create take one and then the, for the first iteration and then take two for the second iteration and so on so number will simply gonna be assigned to each and every individual variable in here within my list afterwards i'm going to say okay sum all right or sum underscore numbers which is my accumulators accumulator equals to sum underscore numbers plus number all right okay so what happened here so what happened is is i said okay let's go ahead and take my sum numbers which is initialized to zero so let's take a look at the for loop when we're actually starting just starting in the beginning so what happened is numbers num for number in numbers so numbers we have here have one two three four five and eight and six all right so first iteration i'm gonna go take number the first one in numbers so number here will have the value of one so here i have one right so one plus some numbers which has initialized it to zero so zero plus one equals to one all right so what we are doing we're simply we're simply kind of overwriting every time taking the sum numbers old add number to it and write it over to some numbers and create a new accumulator and that's what we call it some numbers new per se so in the first iteration what we're going to be doing we're actually going to be adding zero plus one and that should generate simply the new value which is going to be one and what's going to happen is in the second loop we're actually going to go ahead uh, again i'm going to take the next number which is going to be two right so i'm going to come here at two plus one and that will become three and so on i keep repeating this simply like several times and that'll be going to be actually our let's say second loop or second iteration so second iteration we're going to be let's say i'm going to take the new sum numbers plus one add to it the second value here which is two all right and that should generate number three 
and so on. And I keep repeating this several times until I actually finish all the numbers in here. And that should generate simply our accumulator. So what we could do afterwards, we're going to say, okay, print, and I'm going to print some underscore numbers. All right, so press shift enter, here we go. So now we obtained some numbers, which is 21, which is basically summation of six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one. All right, so now it's time for a quick challenge. What I'm asking you guys to do is to do repeat pretty much the exact same elements in here, okay, exact same code per se, but I don't want to obtain the sum of numbers. I wanted to get the multiplication of all numbers. So I'm gonna get multiplication of all the elements all my apologies all the elements in the list please go ahead pause the video and maybe make some changes again this numbers keep it the same maybe some changes to here maybe some changes to here to just be able to obtain the multiplication of all these elements together all right please go ahead pause the video and i'll see you guys after the challenge all right i hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge so what i ask you guys to do is to simply copy this paste it here and instead of just summing all the numbers, I wanted to multiply all the numbers. In order to do that, let's actually remove this to avoid confusion. So in order to do this, simply put what you guys could do, you can say, okay, I need to multiply all these numbers. So first of all, the accumulator here, I can't set it to zero, okay? Because zero multiplied by any value will gonna be zero. I need to set that, multi that variable to one. And instead of calling it some numbers, I'm going to call it, let's say, multiply, let's say, numbers. So let's say just, you know, you call it whatever. Here I call it multiply numbers, which is simply con contains the multiplication of all the values. And what I could do here, I'm going to say, okay, go to each number, grab the numbers, right? So I'm going to grab one, two, three, and so on. Every time, instead of addition, I was just going to make it multiplication. And instead of some numbers, I was just going to define it as multiply numbers. We're going to copy paste. We're going to copy paste. And here I'm gonna go ahead and multiply and print multiply numbers. All right, that's pretty much it. Press shift enter and here we go. We'll end up with 720, which is simply the multiplication of all these numbers together. All right, I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge and I hope the lecture was, uh, was pretty easy. Um, and that will conclude our lecture. Let's go ahead and review what we have done so far. So in this lecture, we're able to get, a, get kind of, you know, like an, 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 um, a head start and learn how can we create a for loop, all right? And the overall idea of for loops is that we wanted to repeat a certain part within the code several times, and that's what we have done here. We're able to repeat and print, for example, all the elements within my list, which is one, two, and three here, and we're able as well to, let's say, if you wanted to, repeat um, like a print operation, like as we have done here, we printed the numbers, and we printed as well, hello world, and then afterwards, what we'll be able as well to do is to print elements or strings within our list. So not just numbers, we can actually print as well strings, which is apples, you know, blueberries and so on. And then we're able as well to print characters too, such as, you know, like if, um, if we do for i in and then we we'll define any string, then we'll be able to actually print all the characters within our string. And then finally here, we're able to create kind of a mini, mini code that will help us to um, uh, define an accumulator or repeat or sum all the elements within our list in here and also for a mini challenge to multiply all the elements within the list. All right, that's pretty much all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In the next lecture, I'm going to walk you through again more examples for the four loops and that should conclude that section and then we're going to move ahead to a kind of more advanced forms of, of loops well, like, such as while loops and different kind of loops, nested loops. I hope you guys enjoy this lecture and see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome to this new lecture. In the previous lecture, we were able to learn a lot of information about for loops and we've covered kind of wide range of, of, um, of options within for loops, like, you know, like how to perform range, how to do nested loops, how to do list comprehensions. Now to the fun part, let's take a, sh you know, kind of a little bit of shift and, and see a, um, a different type of, of loops, which is what we call it while loops. So while loops can be used to execute a set of statements as long as a certain condition holds true. All right, what do you mean by this? Let's assume that I wanted to print numbers, let's say from zero till 10. What I could do, I could say, okay, let's define an index when define it as set it as zero. And what I could say, I would say, okay, while i is less than or equals to 10, and then add the colon, press enter, print i, 
and every time I'm going to say i equals to i plus 1. All right. Shift enter. Here we go. So now I'll be able to print 1 to 10. Let's see what happened here. So what happened here is that I defined a variable, set it to 0, and I define here what we call the while loop. Okay. Think of a while loop as kind of, you know, like a, as kind of, you know, it's, it's a loop with an if condition in it at the same time. So think of it here. I'm saying, okay, while, okay, as long as, or while, if you find that condition is true, please go ahead and execute this. Keep repeating, 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 as long as that condition is true. Think of it again as kind of, you know, you're doing a loop with an if condition associated with it. As long as i is less than or equal to 10, print i and increment i with 1. Go up again and do it again. Let's take a look at, you know, like at this loop from scratch. First one, first run, we're going here and saying, okay, i equals to 0. That was the, my initialization. I'm going to go here and say, okay, is 0 less than or equal to 10? Yes. That means that condition is true. So while true, so I'm saying, okay, that condition was true, right? That's good. That means I'm going to go here and print i. And that's why I was able to print 0. And then come here, take 0, add 1 to it, becomes 1, and put it here, becomes 1. So I'll go up here again. I'm not going to go here. This is initialization. This is just something in the past. I go here in the while and check again. Is 1 less than 10? Yes. So go here, print 1. And then go here, increment 1 becomes 2. Go up here again. Is 2 less than or equal 10? Yes. So print 2, print 2, go here, becomes 3. Go up again and do, do, repeat, repeat, until you actually print number 10, which is here. You print it out. And then you come here, you say, okay, 10 plus 1 is 11. You go, uh, you go up here, here. Is 11 less than or equal 10? No, right? This is the, this, this is the element. That's where the loop will going to be broken. So that what's happened is you're gonna, just going to skip this. You're not going to execute the body of the while anymore. You go here and there is more lines. Well, we're going to execute it. If not, exit. And that's why we're able to print numbers from 0 till 10. And that's pretty much how while loop works in a nutshell. Okay? All right. Okay, let's take a look at another example. What I'm going to ask you guys to do kind of as a quick challenge, I want you guys to print numbers from 3 till 20. Okay, I want you to print numbers from 3 to 20 using while loops okay all right so that's kind of a mini challenge please go ahead pause the video and i'll see you guys after the challenge all right i hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge what i ask you guys to do is to simply pretty much go here copy that code put it here and i wanted to print numbers from 3 till 20 so here instead of initializing it to 0 i'm going to initialize it to 3 and here instead of stopping at 10 i'm just going to stop at 20 enter here we go so now i've been able to print three four five and so on up until you reach number 20 okay that's pretty straightforward all right let's take a look at another um, kind of example if we do while true so if i say let's say well, i equals to let's say zero okay and if i say while true okay print let's say i okay if i do this all right this is a disaster okay that means it's what we call it an infinite loop when I say while true, that means I'm asking all the time just to repeat this and do it all the time, forever, okay? Let's actually give it a shot and let's see what's going to happen, okay? Obviously, with the kernel, we're going to break, so if, please, if you're going to run it, expect that you need to go and actually stop the kernel or interrupt it somehow. So shift enter, here we go. So I'm printing 0, 0, 0, 0, so just keep going. And I'm going to do kernel interrupt, okay, to just stop the kernel and maybe restart the kernel. Restart, okay? So, all right, so it's still, okay, so it's interrupted, that's good. Let's go ahead and actually do kernel, maybe restart and clear output. All right, here we go. So what happened here is I said, okay, let's go ahead and while true, so all the time, just print I or print zero all the time forever, which is crazy, obviously, we don't want to do this. What we want to do, maybe add a little bit of smartness. I'm going to say, okay, every time take I and maybe I, increment i plus 1 and maybe make a condition if you find if i was greater than or equal let's say 10 we're going to break Shift enter here we go now we're able to print numbers from 1 till 9 okay okay let's take it let's read it one more time 
So again, the idea here I wanted just to illustrate for to you guys, what do you mean by while true? The idea of while true is simply just go ahead, execute the commands forever, basically, which is something that we don't want to do. So when I say while true print i, every time go here, increment i, so i becomes here one and then two and then three and then four and so on. And here we can add simply what we have done here. We can say, okay, go ahead, repeat the entire loop unless a certain condition is satisfied. And when says that condition is satisfied, you're just going to break, all right? So I'm going to say, okay, if you find i greater than or equals to 10, you're just going to break. And that's where, why we're able to print simply numbers from 1, 0 to 9. If you wanted to make it, let's say, 11, shift enter, that basically would be equivalent exactly to this code because the outcome is exactly the same, 0 to 10. Here, the numbers was 0 to 10, all right? The only difference is... When we, when we do while and then we add the condition after it, it's kind of, think of it again, we added a while, a loop with an if condition, just both of them intact in one spot, okay? What we have done here, it was separated the while, so we separated the loop, so we make it while true, just repeat forever, and we separated, we wrote the if condition manually, separately here. And this is pretty much the same, printing the, pretty much the same um, content as the previous time. All right, okay, let's go ahead for a quick challenge. I wanted to print numbers from three to 20 using that format, exactly the same format. I just wanted to print numbers from three to 20. Please go ahead, pause the video, and I'll see you guys after the challenge. All right, I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge. We're just gonna copy that, paste it here. And simply, I wanted to print numbers from three up until 20, so just gonna stop here to 21. Shift enter, here we go. We're able to print numbers from 3, 4, 5, and so on up until 20. And that's pretty much equivalent to what we have done here in this section. All right. Okay. And that concludes the uh, for and while loop section. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In the next lecture, we're just going to get started and actually start, you know, doing a lot of exercises because we're going to have, hopefully have fun. We're going to have, I think we have like almost 10 plus exercises with tons of videos and tons of explanations. Best of luck. And I will see you guys in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to this project. In this project, we're going to build a very simple, uh, what we call a guessing game. So we're going to um, ask the computer to generate a random number, whatever that number is, from one to let's say 50, okay? And then we're going to uh, ask the users to enter a number, and if that number matches the computer guess, we're just gonna print to the screen, say, okay, you guessed it right. If not, then we're gonna start to guide the, the user to uh, either increase the number or decrease the number to actually get closer to the, to the um, random number that has been generated by the computer. It's very, very simple uh, game, but we're just gonna teach you a lot of concepts about how to generate a random number, how to apply an if-else condition, and so on and so forth, all right? Let's get started. So first of all, as we mentioned, we wanted to generate a random number, okay? So first, we're going to import random. And then the next step that we're going to um, generate mainly uh, a random a number, which is gonna be an integer number from one to let's say 50 or one to 49. So here we're going to specify random dot rand int for rand integer. And then we're going to specify the range, any number from one to let's say uh, 49, okay? And we're gonna put whatever generated number, we're gonna put it in a true number. And that will be the kind of the computer guess that the input or the user input will try to uh, match somehow. All right, <clears throat> so let's run the first two cells. So this is the first cell. So again, you press shift enter to run the cell. The next step, we're going to again, press shift enter to run the next cell. And then now we have a true number. All right, let's, let's see what that true number is first. Okay, so if we again, uh, press A, that will create a new, uh, a new cell for us. And then we're going to, let's say, if we want to plot our true number, Let's run it, and the our actually number that the guess it has been 43. Okay, if you actually if you want to run it again, it will generate maybe like seven. Run it again, generate 39, and so on and so forth. And that's the whole idea. It's just you know for the asking the computer to generate a random a random number for us, and then we're going to ask the user to try to feed or input a number. All right. Okay. So how can we ask a user to actually feed a number to us? All right. So uh, as we covered earlier uh, in, in previous sections, that we're going to use the uh, input function, and then we're going to write whatever we want to be prompted to the user as an, uh, as an input. So we're going to press or write input, all right? 
and then here between bracket we're gonna specify a string and that will gonna be kind of the message that we're gonna be prompted to the user so if you put input enter your guess between 1 and 49 for instance or whatever whatever uh, message you want it okay and then what's gonna happen is the user will gonna feed an input so the the point is here is that the program will will halt it will not gonna continue until we actually uh, input a value okay and then once the input was the user input that value we're gonna assume it's actually an integer so we're gonna cast it to become an integer all right and then that will be my guess number so now I have two numbers I have my uh, true number which is um, the guess number by the computer and then I have the what we call it the guess number which is the input came uh, from the user and then we'll try to compare these two inputs together it's just a very very simple uh, exercise but again, it's just, you know, kind of the first project. We're going to go into a little uh, way more um, uh, complex projects moving forward. But this is, again, kind of a warm-up. All right, let's, let's run it. So once we run it, you're going to say, okay, this is the message that you actually specified. Enter your guess between 1 and 49. Okay? So let's assume that I don't know that the actual true number is 45 in this case. We'll just assume, let's say, it's 30. All right? Now let's press Enter. All right? And then you will see that here the cell has been, uh, has been ran. Okay? So now my true number is 44, my guess number is 30. So the idea is here we wanted to compare simply the two, okay? Actually, let's sh show the guess number. So again, it's 30. Here our true number is 44, and now we wanted to compare, all right? So in, or in order to perform a uh, comparison, in a very simple form, we want to uh, perform uh, reuse if condition, okay? All right, so first of all, if the user is lucky and he insert the number uh, that matches the computer guess, then we're going to print, okay, now you're lucky, now you're good, you know, you match it right. So we're going to say here, if condition, if our guess number equals equals, which means that's when you are actually performing an, an if condition or, um, or check for equality, equals to true number, all right, okay? Then you're going to print, you are right, good job, or whatever you want to print, all right? And then once you are right, then what you need to do is that you actually need to break what we call the while loop that's happening here. So the whole idea is we're going to write kind of different if conditions, okay? And we're going to put all of them in a while loop, okay? The whole idea is that we wanted the program to be running all the time until the user gets it right, okay? So we're going to only going to break the loop, okay? We're going to put break, which is simply we're going to break our while loop only if the uh, user feeds the number uh, right, okay? All right. So here, just to give an idea of the, the while loop, so here we have while true, which means all the time, while one, which means all the time we're going to be running that loop, okay, until you actually break it, all right, okay, which, again, we're going to break it only if our guest number is equal to the true number, all right, and then the next step is if our uh, guest number is less than the true number, then we'll try to guide the user somehow. We're going to say, okay, your guess is low, try again, which try to kind of, you know, like a higher number. All right, and then we're gonna feed another input and so on and so forth, okay? The next step is, well, if the guess number is greater than the true number, then we're going to assume that, again, we're gonna guide him. We're gonna mention, okay, your guess is high, try again. Um, so the, the user will try to input a smaller number, okay? All right, let's walk you through it. So that's our if condition, if the user feeds it, feeds it right. The next step is else if, if guess number is less than our true number, okay? So if the guess number is less than our true number, which is our case here, then we're going to say, okay, your guess is low, try again. And then the user, we're gonna be expecting the user to actually feed an input right away, okay? So here we're gonna say, okay, so input, enter your guess between again one and 49, all right? And then we're gonna again specify as an integer, and that will be my new guess number. So we're gonna overwrite the previous guess number, which is here about 30, by let's say whatever input we're gonna be, the user gonna be feeding, all right? And then else if, if our guess number is greater than the true number, we're going to say, okay, print, your guess is high, try again, and then afterwards, we're going to, again, ask the user to input another number. Simply put, we're going to do a while loop, asking the user to give us whatever number, if it's smaller or it's greater. However, if it's equal, we're just going to break the loop, in a nutshell. All right? Okay. So let's run it, and let's see what's going to happen. If we run it, we're going to say, okay, because our guess number was 30, and while the true number is 44, then we're going to say, okay, your guess is low, try again, which means we didn't execute this, we did not execute it, we did not execute this, we only executed that portion only, which is, you know, the part of the else if here, all right? Okay, 
So let's assume enter your, your guess is low, so you're assuming you're gonna you know, increase the number somehow. So let's assume that we're gonna write 35. Press enter. I'm gonna say, okay, your guess is low again, try again. Why? Because you didn't reach it. Again, we didn't execute this portion. You didn't execute that portion. You only executed this portion. All right, let's try again, make it 40. All right, let's try again. Your guess is still low. Let's try 43. All right, again, your guess is still low. And if you, once you try 44, that's where you actually say, okay, now your guess number matches the true number. And then you say, okay, you're right, good job. And simply you break the loop and that's why you'll see here you're not running the loop anymore. All right, and that's pretty much um, a very simple, again, a guessing game. You can have it like a little bit more advanced by adding, for example, different bounds that say, okay, you are a little bit closer to the true number, giving, giving probably more hints, for instance. And there's a lot of additions that you can add to the game. But again, this is a very simple uh, guessing game. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the next project. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this project. In this project, again, it's a simple project that we uh, are going to build, or call it the paper fortune teller, okay? It's kind of, you know, like a fun game, um, mainly used by, by kids, that we here, and we're going to select, we're going to ask mainly the, you know, the, uh, the player to enter or to give us one of four colors. So here the color we selected are mainly yellow, green, blue, and red. And once the user feeds in the color, then we're going to ask him to feed a number, which is, you know, ranging from one till eight. And then based on that combination, then we're going to tell them, okay, what's your fortune going to look like? We're going to be, let's say, the president of, you know, of US. We're going to be like a millionaire, whatever. Okay, then you can build kind of, you know, a fun game. Instead of actually building your game yourself, you can do it in Python. Again, this code is pretty simple. It's a fun game. And again, in future projects, we're going to have way more um, complex um, and, um, and practical uh, projects moving forward. So again, that's the paper, uh, paper fortune teller. So here we have the code for it. So let's walk you through it. So first, we're going to import random. Okay, and then the next step is we're going to ask the user or kind of, you know, having a kind of a welcome message to the user. So we're going to, I'm going to show you what do you mean by answer yes first, but here we're going to print welcome to the fortune teller. So just, you know, welcome to the player, for example. And then we're going to say, okay, what are the rules for the game? Okay, so we're going to print, you will select the color and the number, and I will tell you what the future holds for you. Okay, again, you can write whatever welcome message you want. All right, so let me actually skip that part. I'm going to press B to create a new cell. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to run that. That we're going to tell you, okay, welcome to the fortune teller. You will select the color and number, and I will tell you what the fortune future will hold for you. Okay? All right. The next step is we're going to simply create a while loop because we wanted to ask the user if you wanted to play several times or not. Okay? So we're going to create a while loop, but we're not going to set it to while true as we have done before. We're going to ask it kind of, you know, check on a condition. We're going to say, okay, while answer equals to yes. So as long as the user say yes, which means I wanted to play more, we're going to keep looping through the game. Once the user feeds whatever value, like no or whatever value, then we're going to exit basically this game. Okay? All right? So first, well, again, as I mentioned, we're going to ask the user to enter a color first and then followed by a number from one to eight. So first, we're going to ask the user, prompt the user to input a color, which is again very simple. We had that before. So color equals to input, select the color, then we actually gave them the options, yellow, green, blue, and, and red. And then once the user inputs a color, okay, if the color is yellow or green, then we actually have within the actual, again, the design of the game, if, if the color is within one of these two um, uh, colors, the number, okay, which is, again, we're gonna be one, two, five, or six. These are the numbers under the colors. So when the user select these two colors, one of these two colors, and that's why here we have, if the color is yellow or the color is green, then we're going to ask or prompt the user to actually input our, um, our number, which again ranges from, yes, from one till eight. But here, once the user inputs the color yellow or green, then, we, then the number we're going to be either one, two, five, or six. We can actually prompt the user to input not any number from one till eight, actually numbers one, two, five, or six. Okay? All right. And then we're going to simply put, uh, we're gonna uh, implement an if condition that can go through all of these numbers, okay? If the number is one, we're gonna write whatever we want. Okay, that's gonna be the, you know, the fortune uh, telling uh, part of it. If the number is equals to one, then we're gonna say, okay, print, you know, like, worried about your future career, don't worry. 
you know, I will 100% get you what you will get 100% get what you want. Just be patient. Else, if the number equals to two, you will become a millionaire at the age of, let's say, 35. Okay. Else, if number is equals to five, you will have a great family with, let's say, 10 kids and so on. And that's, you know, kind of, you know, how you build your, your fortune teller game. All right. And then if else, if the number is six, you will become famous and everyone will love you. So hold here, as you guys can see here, these are the options that we have. So again, once the user feeds in the color, which is going to be here, yellow or green. Okay. We're going to have, again, kind of a nested, a nested if conditions, you know, so we have a first if condition that tells you, okay, what color did you select? If they are yellow or green, we're going to go there. If they are blue or red, we're going to go there. Within these two, we're going to select based on the number that the user is going to be inputting. And that's why there is an, a kind of nested or two if conditions within each other. Okay? All right. What if the user didn't input, you know, any of the numbers? You know, if you if you have one, two, five, or six of the user inputs, let's say, whatever, four. So here we're going to say, okay, print only numbers one, two, five are the only numbers allowed. That's kind of, you know, to prompt the user to input numbers within the actual options that we have. Okay? So that would be our first if condition. Okay? All right? The next if condition, if the color, if the user selected, you know, the other two colors, which is red or blue. So il, else if, if our color equals to blue or the color equals to red, we're going to have, again, we're going to prompt the user to input a number. But that number has to be between 3, 4, 7, or 8, which are the rest of the numbers uh, that we have here. So again, we're going to ask the user to input, select a number again, and that will be, again, our integer value. And then we're going to feed it here as a number. And then we're going to check the number. Okay, again, that's our if condition within the big or major if condition. So simply put, we have an if condition for our colors. We have if condition for our numbers. Okay, so we have if the number equals to three, then I'm going to have okay, you will live a happy life, you know, in hundred years. Else, if number equal four, you'll have success for a doctor one day. Else, if number seven, you know, and number eight, and so on. And then else, the last else here for our if condition, sorry, for our if condition here. I'm going to say, okay, numbers are three, four, seven, eight are the only numbers allowed. Okay? All right. Okay. And then what if the user did it actually feed, you know, one of the colors to start with? So here we have, again, we have an if condition, the big one, okay, here, selecting if the number is yellow or green, if the color yellow or green, then we're here. If the number are, if the color is blue or red, then we're here. If the colors are whatever, if the user inputs, you know, any color that's not in the list, then we're going to say, okay, no, else, print, these are the only colors that are allowed, okay? All right? And then we're going to prompt the user, do you want to play again or not? If the user answered Y, which stands for yes, then we're going to keep looping. If not, we're going to say no, and that's it. All right. So let's try it. Let's see what what's the fortune is. Okay, so let's run it. Let's run it here. I'm going to say, okay, select the color, yellow, green, blue, or red. So we're going to say, okay, I'm going to select red, assuming, obviously, they don't know here the options, okay? And then we're going to ask user, okay, select, a number so I'm gonna say okay select number seven they'll tell you okay all your dreams will come true just be patient okay that's just one you know our fortune okay so let's take a look and see actually if we if that makes sense or not so first we selected red so that means we skipped that portion we actually came here and then we're going to select a number which is gonna be seven so that will be my number here seven and all these come true just be patient that makes sense and then we came down here we asked the user okay do we need to insert another number or not you know, when they keep playing or not. And that's why, that's why you need to answer, okay, yes, for instance. And say, okay, select the color again. Because here, if the answer is yes. Here we came to here. The while is true. We'll keep going. All right, let's insert, for example, blue, number eight. And that will tell you, okay, you're lucky. You will have it all one day. So that will be eight. Here, you're lucky you have it all one day. Okay. All right, you want to play again? Let's say yes. And let's assume that I have, you know, like a user who doesn't follow the instructions, all right? So let's assume that select the color. So I'm going to say, okay, the color is whatever, violet, for example, whatever, whatever color. Okay, I'll tell you, okay, these are the only colors that are allowed, you know? So basically, you went here to the else part, which is in the end, insert, uh, insert the color that's not in the, in the list, okay? All right, you want to play again? You'll say yes. All right, select the colors, yellow, green, blue, or red. So we're going to say, okay, let's say it's green. And let's assume the numbers that are allowed only are 1, 2, 5, and 6. Let's assume the user selected, let's say, 3. It'll tell you, okay, these are the only numbers allowed. Do you want to play or again or not? 
would simply put here you insert in a number that's not one of the options, all right? So again, the code is pretty, uh, I would say, intact per se, which means that you can, you know, assume that the user, if the user inputs an input, uh, any value that's not within the options, you know, the game doesn't crash or anything. It's actually, it's still, still working. So if you say no, then you say, okay, okay, again, you broke the loop here and you're done uh, because here you didn't insert, insert Y again, all right? Okay, that's pretty much all what I have for this section. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the next project. Hello everyone and welcome to this project. In this project, we're going to ask the user to um, input their date of birth, okay? And then we're going to predict or, you know, provide their age along with their um, um, zodiac sign, okay? So here I tried to kind of include the table that includes all the zodiac signs along with the date of birth range. So we have, you know, areas, for example, between March 21st and April 19th. We have, let's say, uh, cancer between June 21st and July 22nd. So the whole idea is once the user inputs their, uh, their date, okay, date of birth, then you can simply apply an if condition that can select, okay, between these two, two dates, okay, then that will be gonna be cancer, between these two dates gonna be Leo and so on and so forth. Again, it's pretty simple um, kind of game per se or project. I'm gonna teach you how can we uh, deal, um, how, can, how can we uh, obtain uh, information from the computer, like the date, for example, the today's date, because you wanna get the expect the, uh, or predict the age along with some, you know, like uh, if condition, which is again, pretty, pretty simple. So let's get started. First, we're going to ask the user to input their date of birth, including the year, the month, and the day, okay? So that would be the first step. Let's ignore the, this for now. First step, we're gonna ask, okay, input. We have done that before several times. What's your year of birth? And then I'm gonna give them an example as well. So with the format, we're gonna be matching our example. And then gonna input our, what's your month? of birth as well, I'm gonna specify, let's say October here. And then what's your day, which is gonna be the day of, uh, the, your day of birth is gonna be, let's say 25, okay? And that will be our year, 1992, month and day, okay? All right, once you do that, then we can actually print to the user, okay, that's your date of birth is, and then we can specify, okay, that's our first variable day, and then we're gonna add plus, and then we're gonna add here our uh, backslash, Okay, just to specify the date as in kind of, you know, like a date format, it's gonna be kind of uh, good visually. And then gonna add plus month, and then gonna add plus as well, the year here too. And then we're gonna be our, you're gonna say, okay, that's gonna be your date of birth is like, is something like that. Let's run it. And let's say, okay, what's your year of birth, for example, it's gonna say 1990, for instance. And then what's your month of birth? Let's say it's 05. And then what's the date? Let's say 25. And then we're gonna tell you, okay, you are good. Then you can actually plot it. That's gonna be plotted to the user. Your date of birth is, let's say, 25, 5, 5, 1990, which makes sense. And then the next step is to, in order to know the age, we need to know what's today's date, okay? In order to do that, we can actually use, um, we're gonna import, import date, okay? So we're gonna use from date time, import date, and then we can actually go there and from the computer can extract the information about the date, about the time. It's very useful to actually get current information about what, what's happening right now, okay? So we're gonna do here, we do okay, date dot today, all right? We're gonna have, we use a method today on our date, that will gonna give us our today's date, okay? All right, actually before doing any any activity, let's actually, let's press A, let's copy that here and let's run it, so when you run it, all right, we can actually view today's date. That will tell us, okay, that's our today's date. Let's say 2018, 10, 21, for example, all right? Okay, the next step is we wanted, we wanted to simply put, take the year because we want to predict the age. We're gonna predict the age in a very simple format just from a year's, year's perspective. So we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna take today date, or to, today's day, sorry, dot year, which is gonna be our first argument coming back, coming back here. If we take that, if we subtracted minus the input that the user have inputted here, which is our year, that will tell us our age, okay? So you, and then we're gonna print to the user, your age is something, you know, age, years old. All right, let's run it. That will tell us, okay, you are 28 years old. All right, looks good. And that will be the kind of, you know, the first uh, um, section, uh, or the first um, requirement out of your, uh, your project. The next step is that we wanted to specify what zodiac sign 
uh, does the um, user have? So simply put, we're going to create you know, a list of if conditions. If, for example, the date was between March 21st and April 19th, then you're going to print areas and so on. If it's between June 21st and June, July 22nd, they're going to be canceled and so on and so forth. So if you're going to go here, we're going to say, okay, if, and then we're going to specify if the month, for instance, equals to 12, that means we're in December, and the day is greater than 22, okay, or, all right, and then here we're specifying mainly uh, for the Capricorn. If you go to Capricorn here, you will see that it's between December 22nd and January 19th. Okay, which means it's between two month, month, months. There is December, okay, there is, you know, like let's say it last eight days in December, and the first 19th days in January, okay? So in order to do that, we're gonna specify, okay, if we are in December and our day was greater than uh, 22nd, all right? Does that mean you are 22nd and on December, or you are between, if you, or if you are in January, Sorry, if you are in January, the month equals to one. That means you're January. And if the day is less than 19, then we're just gonna print, uh, then our sign, we're gonna be um, Capricorn. And then here at the end, obviously, we're gonna print the sign, all right? And then we're gonna do all the if conditions as well for the rest, rest of them. Again, if the, if it's, let's say, if Aries, that between you, then you are a mon month of the third, okay, which is the main March, and the day is greater than 21, or if you are in April and the day is less than 19, and so on and so forth. That's pretty much how can you create if else, if else condition to go ahead and uh, scan through the entire um, zodiac signs. All right. Let's actually run that part. So once we run it, I will tell you, okay, that's your Gemini, and that's pretty much how can you uh, you run it. Let's again, let's kernel, let's restart and clear output, and let's run it again. So if you run it, they'll tell you, okay, what's the year? Let's say 1992. Let's say your monthly birth, let's say 10, let's say 25, and that will tell you, okay, that's your date of birth is, you know, 25, 10, 1992. We're gonna take today's date, we're gonna plot today's date again. We're gonna get the difference, we're gonna tell you, okay, you're 26 years old. And if we run this, I'll tell you, okay, then you are Scorpio, and which, may, which makes sense, all right? All right, and that's pretty much all, all what I have for this project. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and see you in the next project.